Hi, I'm Karen Howard, Advocacy Manager at MHA, and thank you for joining today's National Policy Institute. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our program on prevention and early intervention, and we appreciate all of those who made today's event possible, including our sponsor, Kaiser Permanente. We're coming to you live from our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, and are broadcasting worldwide. To join the conversation online, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and use the hashtags MHA Policy 2020 and Before Stage 4, using the number four. I'm especially excited about today's program because it is personally meaningful as someone who experienced early childhood trauma and needed some support in high school, but did not get the help I needed until college. I also saw other peers who would have benefited from mental health services and other supports in school, but were instead directed towards the justice system. In fact, nearly 10 years is the average time between people, but time between when people first experience symptoms of a mental health condition and when they get treatment. That is why we need programs like today's so that we advance policy solutions to facilitate early intervention in childhood. And why not meet students where they are, in schools and communities? Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Don Mordecai, National Leader for Mental Health and Wellness at Kaiser Permanente, who spent decades dedicated to the advancement of policy changes to help people with suicidality and mental health and substance use disorders. He will be followed by Congressman John Katko of New York, one of our great legislative champions, who very early in his first term took the lead on suicide prevention legislation. Greetings, I'm Dr. Don Mordecai, National Leader for Mental Health and Wellness for Kaiser Permanente, and I wanna welcome you to Mental Health America's 2020 Policy Institute. As we all manage through a global pandemic, we see the second crisis in the making, a crisis of mental health, addiction, and deaths of despair. Today's virtual event will explore how to better meet the needs of underserved youth and young adults, including those who identify as black, indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQ+, women during the perinatal period, and how to address healthcare payment and workforce issues. Communities of color have been bearing the brunt of COVID-19 since the pandemic began, and as multiple states across the country are seeing record-breaking spikes in cases, doctors are seeing young people of color with underlying medical conditions being hit harder by the virus than their peers. In fact, across the United States, we're seeing alarming statistics about the disproportionate toll of COVID-19 on people of color. Hispanic and black children are much more likely to require hospitalization for COVID-19, with Hispanic children about eight times as likely as white children to be hospitalized, while black children are about five times as likely. In the city of Chicago and the state of Louisiana, black patients account for 70% of coronavirus deaths, even though they make up roughly only a third of the population. In San Francisco, Latinx account for 15% of the population, but 25% of confirmed COVID-19 cases. These statistics alone are a clear sign that we should be concerned about the potential long-term effects this pandemic will have on children and families, especially families of color, many of whom will experience this pandemic as a long-term trauma. And this collective trauma will be reflected in the mental health of our nation. According to recent research released by the Wellbeing Trust and the Robert Graham Center, as many as 75,000 more people could die from drug or alcohol misuse and suicide as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The American healthcare system has historically been under-resourced for mental health, including shortages in mental health professionals, and mental health care needs have not been addressed with the same urgency as physical health care needs. However, we do see the opportunity to develop policy shifts that can help us begin to meet the great need of the second crisis. Kaiser Permanente, along with many of our partners and like-minded organizations, are working to advance mental health care for everyone not only through the work we're doing to improve care right now, but also by building a model for mental health care based on evidence of what works, measurable outcomes, integration of emerging technologies, and breaking barriers caused by stigma. Today, we have convened experts and visionary leaders to explore the long-term effects associated with COVID-19 on youth mental health and how we can support the mental health of our youth today. The goals of today's program include sharing what we've learned about the mental health impacts of COVID-19 on youth, especially in underserved populations, lifting up current programs and initiatives that focus on early and upstream interventions, 
highlighting promising policy solutions, identifying opportunities for cross-sector collaboration. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Congressman John Katko, who represents New York's 24th District in the United States House of Representatives. In Congress, he serves as a member of the House Homeland Security Committee, as chair of the Transportation Security Subcommittee. He also serves on the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. In 2019, Representative Katko announced $2.5 million in federal funding to address the shortage of mental health professionals in schools. Over a five-year period, this funding is bolstering on-site mental health services with an emphasis on prevention. The American Psychological Association praised Representative Katko for introducing critically needed legislation to help expand access to mental health services for the 115.4 million Americans living in geographical areas without adequate access to mental health care. Please join me in welcoming someone who is creating positive change for mental health care access in the communities he serves and across our country, Congressman John Katko. Hello, this is Congressman John Katko. I want to thank Mental Health America for allowing me to provide opening remarks for today's event on investing in mental health prevention and early intervention services for young people. Such a critical topic. As co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Mental Health Caucus, I work with Republicans and Democrats daily to improve access to quality mental health care and reduce the stigma associated with seeking treatment. The current public health crisis has greatly underscored the need to advance these efforts. During the pandemic, many individuals and especially young people are struggling to deal with the emotional toll of increased economic uncertainty and added precautions that keep people at home. According to data from Mental Health America, over a quarter of a million people screened have suffered from symptoms of anxiety or depression during the pandemic. Additionally, over 42,000 people screened were positive for psychosis, with another 90,000 people experiencing thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That is terrible statistics. In addressing the public health threat posed by COVID-19, we must address the clear toll it has taken on our nation's mental health. To do this, we need to build our, on our efforts to expand access to telehealth, increase outreach and screening, and provide funding for mental health professionals on the front lines. I've been proud to lead efforts in Congress to provide immediate funding to mental health providers that are struggling to meet increased patient volumes while facing significant budget shortfalls. Still, more must be done, especially for students who are gearing up to return to school this fall. With new precautions in place and changing classroom dynamics, many are expecting there to be an increased need for mental health resources for students. We must act now to address the significant gaps in pediatric mental health care, which prevents students from accessing the treatment they need. That's why I'm continuing to a push for my passage, passage of my bill the Mental Health Services for Students Act. This bipartisan legislation, which I authored and introduced with my friend and colleague, Congressman Napolitano, would fund on-site mental health services for youths in schools nationwide. I strongly believe early intervention and prevention uh, in mental health programming is what's vital to building better futures for the many children and families whose lives are impacted by mental illness. In the coming days, I will continue fighting for bipartisan policies that increase mental illness prevention and early intervention, particularly among our youth. Thanks again to the Mental Health America for putting this forum on and allowing me to be a part of it. It's a high honor indeed. For everyone participating, I'd like to remind you, while we are all reckoning with new and unique challenges, it is important to remember that together we can and will get through this. And I will say, that you are all on the front lines and what you do every day is unbelievable. You're the angels of our society and I wanna thank you for fighting the good fight and continuing to do so. May God give you strength and give you the ability to get through these tough times and help so many people that need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kako, for all of your tremendous work. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce MHA's President and CEO, Paul Gianfrido, who is a great statesman and advocate for his son, Tim, and for everyone with mental health conditions. 
as policymakers consider additional changes to meet the country's needs during the pandemic, Paul makes the case that mental health care must be treated as part of our overall health care system and based on MHA screening data that these investments are urgently needed to address increases in anxiety, depression, psychosis, and suicidality, especially for people who are Black, Indigenous, or other races. Paul? Hi, everybody. Welcome to our 2020 Policy Institute. I'm sorry we're not able to do it in person this year, but uh, it's good that we're able to get together. And I'm so glad that so many of you have decided to participate with us today. You know, for us, this is the first of four days this week at Mental Health America that we're going to be doing a number of things. But to me, the work that we're doing today is really essential as we lead into our annual conference week here. And that's because so much really is dependent on policy. And while we'll be focusing today specifically on early identification and intervention, and specifically on what's happening to our children and what we can do for our children, the reality is that this entire world in which we're living right now, this entire world of mental health services and supports in particular, is heavily influenced by the policy decisions uh, that our leaders make. And those decisions will be heavily influenced by the information we provide to them, both in terms of data, in terms of stories, uh, and in terms generally of the recommendations that we can make that they should carry forward, moving forward. Now, when the pandemic hit about six months ago, we made a decision to take our online mental health screening program. It's been in operation since 2014 and to use it to do real-time monitoring of the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of the population. And so starting in March, we began to uh, provide information about what screeners we were seeing and what screening tools they were using. At first, we saw anxiety numbers going up. Later on, we saw depression screening numbers going up. Still later on, we began to see our psychosis screening numbers going up. And we wanted to understand what that all meant and what we could do about it. Well, you can't understand what it all meant until you think about how truly dramatic this particular wave of the pandemic has been. As of July, from March, we have seen in excess of more than a quarter of a million people screening positive or moderate to severe for either anxiety or depression since the start of the pandemic. That's a quarter million more people who would have screened positive before the start of the pandemic by using the baselines that we had from November to January. It's really an extraordinary number when you think about it. And one of the equally extraordinary and scary numbers that we've seen are the 90,000 people who in taking that depression screen have told us that they have thoughts of suicide or self-harm on more than half the days of the week. 90,000 people, 30,000 in July alone. To put that in some context, we were seeing about 4,000 people a month who had those kinds of thoughts in January and in February. And to see that number, which was very similar to the kinds of suicidal experiences we've had with losing 45,000 to 50,000 people every year from suicide as a baseline, to see that number increase so dramatically really causes us to worry. So we've looked at those data and looked at who, for example, is feeling the deepest effects of this pandemic. And we found two populations in particular that really give us a lot of concern. In the black population, for example, we're seeing more frequent suicidal and self-harm thinking than we're seeing in any other population. Not that Blacks are necessarily experiencing depression more frequently, they're just experiencing that particular aspect of it more frequently. And it's young people, the 11 to 17 year olds, who are really feeling the effects of this pandemic the greatest. While one third of people in my age group report suicidal or self-harm thinking on more than half the days of the week, it's more than half of the young people who screen for depression. And it's 90% 
of the young people screening for depression who screen at positive, moderate to severe for depression when they take that screen. So we have to do something about this. There are things we can do at Mental Health America programmatically by ourselves, and there are things we can do programmatically in association with partners and others. But really, if we're going to make changes, they have to be at the policy level because it's policy that's influencing thinking these days. It's not the ideas and thinking of people that's influencing policy so much. So we have to use the policy levers we have to improve early identification of kids, to understand as they return to school that we need to be providing mental health services to each and every one of them. We need to improve our special education services for those who are in serious need of emotional and mental health support. We need to make certain that we have provided adequate resources and funding across communities through behavioral health block grants at the federal level to make sure that we paid for all the services people need, even when they are at the earliest stages of experiencing serious mental health conditions. And we need to make sure that we're doing this work systematically, that we're doing it throughout the nation, and that we're doing it effectively by learning from those people who have piloted prevention strategies and early identification strategies, who have piloted educational strategies to improve circumstances there for people who have been doing the good work and now can set examples for the rest of us of how to continue to do this good work. So I hope you're looking forward to the remainder of the day. I know I am. And I hope you're looking forward to the opportunities we're going to have to hear from true experts throughout the course of the day in all of these areas of prevention and early identification, with particular emphasis on kids and kids of color that we'll be talking about. But what I want to do first uh, is to turn things over to, to Maddie Reinhardt at uh, Mental Health America. It's Maddie who's been responsible for pulling so much of these data together. And it's Maddie now who, along with Karen Howard, is going to be able to take and answer any questions you may have if you want to dive more deeply into the data or into the implications of these data we've been gathering for public policy moving forward. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Paul, and welcome, Maddie. Uh, Maddie is MHA's Manager of Population Health, and her primary role at MHA is to manage our largest program, the screening. Um, at this time, Maddie will answer questions that come in from the chat. So please send your questions in. Um, Maddie, uh, from the 2020 screening overview that you and Teresa released last week, it is clear that several trends have emerged among young people, some of which uh, Paul discussed. Um, but young people who make up a majority of people screening, up to two thirds of screeners are between the ages of 11 to 24 years old. Can you discuss some of the high level trends that you're seeing in the data, especially uh, those that relate to black, indigenous, people of color and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer folks? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Karen and Paul for that introduction. Um, as Paul mentioned, we are seeing 11 to 17 year olds screen positive or moderate to severe at higher rates than any other age group. Um, so in July 2020, 83% of 11 to 17 year olds who took an anxiety screen scored with moderate to severe symptoms of anxiety and 91% um, who took a depression screen scored with moderate to severe symptoms of depression. Um, and with those increases in screening numbers that we've seen, that comes to nearly 44,000 youth in July alone who were screening at risk for moderate to severe anxiety or depression. Um, and 11 to 17 year olds report suicidal ideation at the highest rates of any age group, with 49% of 11 to 17 year olds reporting that they were experiencing serious thoughts of suicide more than half or nearly every day of the previous two weeks. Um, and the data shows us that this growing mental health crisis is not affecting everyone equally, right? So it's affecting Black, Indigenous, and people of color more. So we've seen that Native American or American Indian youth and youth who identify as more than one race are screening more at risk for mental health conditions than youth who identify with any other racial or ethnic group. Um, and we've seen that 
BIPOC communities have also had the largest increases over time during COVID in depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. Um, so in particular, Black or African-American screeners had the highest average percent change over time for both anxiety and depression. Um, and Native American or American Indian screeners had the highest average percent change over time for suicidal ideation. And then for LGBTQ plus youth, um, for both depression and anxiety, the rate of LGBTQ youth scoring with moderate to severe symptoms throughout COVID-19 has actually remained about the same. Um, so LGBTQ youth screen positive for mental health conditions on MHA screening at higher rates than non-LGBTQ plus youth and adults. Um, and across January through July 2020, about 87 to 88 percent um, of LGBTQ plus youth who took the anxiety screen scored for moderate to severe anxiety and around 95% who took the depression screen scored for moderate to severe depression. Um, so the fact that those rates haven't changed also gives us important information. Um, so LGBTQ plus youth are already scoring at such high rates and are already experiencing such persistent anxiety and depression that their mental health needs didn't fluctuate as severely um, as non-LGBTQ youth um, and adults in response to the pandemic. And so that's a population level assessment. There are certainly LGBTQ plus youth um, even more at risk, particularly BIPOC um, LGBTQ youth who experience even more discrimination and trauma at the intersection of race and sexual orientation, um, and those who may have had to quarantine with unsupportive or even abusive um, families or have been separated from their safe communities at school. Um, so those are some of the overall trends that we've seen. Thank you so much. That's so thorough. Um, and you're obviously able to follow the numbers and the data. Um, we had a question come in about the availability of this um, data at the county or regional level. Um, are you able to share about how people might be able to find out what's happening in their region? Yeah, absolutely. So we do um, collect some of that information um, through demographic questions. So when someone comes on and takes a screen, um, they first are met with the screening tool on the first page. Um, and then on the second page, after they complete that, we, we ask um, a number of optional demographic questions. So to receive the results of the screening, people don't have to put in that information, but we actually find that a lot of screeners do. Um, and two of those questions are about um, state and zip code. Um, so if a screener does answer those questions, we are able to break that data down um, at the state or county or zip code level. Um, and we do offer that data to people who are interested um, through, in particular, our associate membership program. But um, if you are interested in receiving that data at that level, um, you can always email me. Um, it's mreinert at mhanational.org, and we can share that in the chat as well. Um, thank you so much, Maddie. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, how does the increase in suicidality during COVID and the, the higher kind of at risk uh, and severity that we're seeing in the screening results relate to prevention and early intervention, which is the theme of today's meeting? Yeah, I mean, First, I think the increase in suicide rates and rates of suicidal ideation shows that we need to do more in terms of prevention and early intervention for mental health crises um, and shows that while we do need to invest more in crisis services that can address the needs of those who are experiencing a stage four mental health crisis, um, it also does show the urgent need to start investing more in that prevention and early intervention so that we can reverse the trend um, in suicide and address mental health needs well before they become crises. Um, so the data in particular on suicide and suicidal ideation um, is important because it shows us where we can really focus that resource allocation and prevention efforts, and it's showing us who's most at risk. 
Um, so we can see again, youth are experiencing suicidal ideation at higher rates than any other age group. Um, and people who identified as another race or Native American or American Indian had the highest rates of suicidal ideation. And so that data really helps us figure out where our prevention and early intervention strategies need to be targeted um, so we can stop the upward trend of suicide and suicidal ideation. Um, and so it shows us where, where we can make a big difference. And so thank you so much for your time, Maddie. And though we're seeing these really concerning trends in our real-time data, um, we're fortunate to be able to use this data in our advocacy and hope that uh, policymakers are able to take thoughtful action to invest in supports and community-based services for young people. Um, as students are heading back to school, mental health concerns are top of mind. Um, for School started for many last weeks. Uh, for some this week and will continue into next week, uh, there will be school starting. Um, let's turn it over to our next moderator and panel, Debbie Plotnick, uh, who will moderate a panel on school-based mental health care. Uh, Debbie Plotnick is the Vice President of State and Federal Advocacy at MHA and is recognized as a national thought leader on a wide range of topics in behavioral health. She provides leadership for grassroots and legislative advocacy across the MHA affiliate network. Thank you again, Maddie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Education Interventions panel at MHA's Policy Institute. I'm um, very excited to announce uh, my boss and MHA's Vice President of Federal and State Advocacy, Debbie Plotnick, will be the moderator of this panel. Debbie is recognized as a national thought leader and contributing expert on a wide range of topics in behavioral health, uh, to local, state, federal policymakers, to national legislator groups, she serves on many task forces and provides background for investigative reporters uh, as she's regularly interviewed by media. In her role at MHA, Debbie provides leadership for grassroots and legislative advocacy across the MHA affiliate network and to national legislator groups. She coordinates efforts of the Regional Policy Council, which focuses on state level initiatives for equal access to behavioral health care, a full continuum of treatment and services, criminal justice diversion, and the value of prevention and early intervention. Her most recent projects include working with the firearm owning community to promote mental health screening and training and suicide prevention for adolescents and adults. Debbie holds three degrees from Bryn Mawr College in political science, uh, social service, and law and social policy. And these inform her passion and perspective. Uh, she also talks about her own lived experience with depression, a family member who had mental health challenges, um, and, her, and her dedication to mental health and systems advocacy. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Debbie Plotnick. Thank you, Karen. It's so wonderful to be here and moderating this really important panel today. Um, education is such an important place to really um, dive into issues around mental health. As you know, here at Mental Health America, we um, have all of our programs really have our before stage four philosophy embedded in all of them. And we know that when we follow that philosophy of prevention for all, early intervention, especially for people at risk, integrated care and services and recovery as a goal, then everyone does better. And nowhere is that more important than in the education arena. As we heard from our colleague, Maddie Reinhardt, with this screening data, we know that the incidence of depression, anxiety, um, feelings and thoughts of uh, suicide of hurting oneself or even wanting to take one's own life has been expanding tremendously over the course of this pandemic. But what we also know and what we've 
all known for many years and we'll hear from our panel members, is that major mental health conditions almost always manifest in adolescence. And we know that when we get in there early, when we identify and where are kids at this point in their lives, they are in school. So we know that in school services make a huge difference to the outcomes of how kids do and keeping them in school. So let me just take a minute and just give the briefest um, introduction for our panel members today. We have Amy Malloy, who is the program director at our Mental Health Association of New York State. That's our MHA affiliate in New York State. And you'll hear more from Amy about how she directs the Mental Health Resource and Training Center um, based at our MHA in New York State. And she's also a school board member. She's on the Queensbury Union Free School District in New York. And so she comes at it with many different perspectives. She'll tell you more about how this affiliate was the, one of the first in the country to work very hard and get a law passed for education from K through 12 for mental health. We'll hear from uh, Ariana Gross. And Ariana is a board member, um, a youth advisory board member at Sandy Hook Promise. But she also is a student herself. She is an honor roll student at the Academy of Liberal Arts at the Newtown High School in Covington, Georgia. And we will also hear from national expert, Dr. Sarah Wakefield. She's a child and adolescent and forensic psychiatrist. Um, she is the um, director of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Services and the director of Medi uh, medical director and medical ethics at the Texas Tech University. And it's so important to Dr. Wakefield to work with families in finding their way, in finding acceptance, in finding wellness, and in ending the school to prison pipeline. So let me just turn things over to our panelists. And I'm going to ask you to speak in this order, Amy, Ariana and Dr. Wakefield, and tell us a little bit more about yourselves and your programs, please. Thank you so much, Debbie, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. It's um, such an important topic for us to be talking about right now. Um, so for myself, I've been with the Mental Health Association for only about three years. Prior to that, I was working in suicide prevention. Um, I'm trained as a school counselor. So this has been a really exciting opportunity for me as the project director of the School Mental Health Resource and Training Center. I get to provide support to school counselors, administrators, teachers, all across New York State. So it's been a really wonderful opportunity. Um, the Mental Health Association in New York, as you said, is a chapter of Mental Health America. Uh, we have a long, rich history of providing um, support and raising awareness um, in communities around mental health um, for about 60 years. In fact, uh, we have a member network of 26 affiliates that provide everything from peer support services to clinical services and crisis services, housing and day programs. And they've been a really important part of our work through the Resource Center because they have been the um, community providers kind of on the ground in the communities and that's helped us, I think, um, better reach and meet the needs of individual school districts across the state. Um, as you said, we were the leading advocate for the mental health education law. New York was the first state in the nation to um, sign into law a comprehensive um, mental health education initiative and, and we um, are teaching mental health to students in grades kindergarten through 12th grade and um, I'm sure we'll be talking more about that later, but through the Resource Center, we provide professional development to staff, we provide resources for developing curriculum, um, and we provide information and support uh, resources to families as well, because it's an important part of the conversation. Ariana, tell us about yourself, please, and a little bit about your, the work that you do. 
Hello, I'm Ariana Gross, and I am a part of Sandy Hook Promise through their Youth Advisory Board, but also through Jared's Heart of Success Promise Club. Um, and in these programs, we educate youth on how they can support their peers while also building a community of people um, because our, one of our mindsets is that we can help each other in reaching that goal of us all being better with our mental health. And so um, my passion for mental health has really been um, spiked through being a part of these organizations. Um, I was lucky enough to be chosen to be able to speak in front of Congress on behalf of youth for mental health. And that experience was truly amazing. And being able to stand up for policies such as the Stand Up Act and um, getting mental health professionals in schools is something that's so important to me. Because um, one thing that we focus on within Safe, Safe Promise Clubs and Sandy Hook Promise is stopping violence through the, the, the channel of mental wellness and mental health and keeping people's mental health great so that they can make the best choices possible so they don't um, hurt themselves or other people and just so that they can live the best life they possibly can because that's something we all deserve the right to and by going to mental health it just allows us all to live the best lives we can and build communities that are strong enough to endure anything so yes thank you guys Dr. Wakefield? Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I just, I'm so overwhelmed by everything that you guys are doing and uh, know so much how much a village it takes uh, to address mental health concerns and mental health distress. And it's so exciting to hear the things that are going on around the country and the involvement at so many different levels from policy to groundwork within the schools. Uh, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. That's how I think of myself first, I think, maybe other than, than a mom. Um, but I, uh, so I do have school age children, um, but I'm, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a forensic psychiatrist. So I see lots and lots of kids in our area. I also see our, um, all of our kids in our long-term detention program and the juvenile justice program. Um, and what I know for sure is that we're not intervening early enough and that many of our children uh, are suffering consequences of their mental health distress because of multi-generational traumas and lack of treatment uh, for their parents and their parents and that it is a community health issue and that it will take all of us to work together to address. And so, but it is my commitment, my lifelong commitment to do this work and I feel honored and privileged to um, be a part of this mission. Thank you, thank you all. I'd like to start with some, some questions. I'm gonna start with Ariana. Ariana, this is a really difficult time. I know it's been hard with kids being out of school and now they're heading back to school um, during the pandemic. And, and in, in certain places, certainly in Georgia, there's high rates of transmission. What are you and your, and your fellow students experiencing as you're in this period of heading back to school? Um, it's, it's, I, this is a great question because I think, um, youth today are going through one of the most unique challenges, um, that I think history has ever seen. And one thing that I know that we're experiencing is the loneliness that comes with part of self-isolation. Cause I know from personal experience, a lot of, um, I won't be seeing a lot of my friends for a long time. I haven't seen them since about March and I won't, I don't know when I'll be able to see them again. And it's the fact that we're still busy during these times. I, I have to watch my siblings. Um, and one of my brothers suffers with autism and like, I have to help out with my family cause you know, fam, um, Family matters also come. So it's putting family stresses with, um, with school stresses and then that emotional stress of not having the support that we need. And I think that this is such an important um, issue to hit on. And um, one thing I hope to talk about later is just building connections that students can have and making sure that we have the support that we need to make it through these times, just as anyone does. But I think there's a specific, unique experience that comes with being a teen during these times. 
Thank you, Ariana. Um, indeed, and your and your program um, that that you're involved in offers supports to students. Isn't that correct? Yes. Tell um, us a little bit more about that, please. Yes, ma'am. So through, um, I'll start with Giratara Success. We hold wellness calls. Um, at first, it was for our team to stay positive and keep working through these hard times. And then we opened them up to the community so that everybody could take part in this um, awesome training that we get from Alicia Gentile, who is our health um, coach. And it's really awesome. And everybody can come in and just learn how to take care of themselves during these times, which is something that I think is absolutely amazing. Um, more things that we do is through um, Save, Save, Save Promise Clubs and Sandy Hill Promise is not stopping because of COVID. And that's one thing I'm so proud of is all the organizations I work with are not stopping. We're going to keep going. And so Start With Hello is something I'm very excited about. It's going to give students, um, with the, the part where I was talking about, about feeling lonely, it's going to allow students to make some great friends, just as they had been before COVID. Um, but at least they'll have people now during this time, which I think is absolutely amazing. So those are just some of the things that my um, chapters have been doing. And I think that's just awesome. Thank you, Ariana. That is indeed awesome. Let me, let me switch gears a little bit and move over to Amy and, and talk a little bit about the fact that you and um, your MHA affiliate, uh, Mental Health Association in New York State, passed that first statewide law that required mental health education in schools. In fact, we hold it up as a national model. And what can you tell us about how that um, policy change was so important and what you've been learning as it's being implemented um, in, in New York State? Okay, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. We first started having these conversations about 10 years ago, and I don't think we could have ever imagined that we would sort of be in this environment where we are now. And so when I heard Ariana talking about the, the stress the students are feeling and the loneliness, and I think it was, it was more important than we ever could have imagined, especially given the current climate. Um, but, you know, we have been working to end stigma and discrimination and promote mental health and wellness and, uh, um, and recovery for many, many years. And some of the research that had come out in mental health literacy um, had really kind of guided our advocacy efforts. And, and if people have taken mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid, they're familiar with that program. Um, that is also based in mental health literacy research. And essentially what that research tells us is that if we had a better understanding about mental health, better understanding of the coping strategies we can use to keep ourselves well, better understanding of risk and protective factors, um, people are able to get the help that they need sooner. And when you look at the statistics among youth mental health challenges um, and the fact that it often takes between eight and 10 years for people to get connected to the help that they need, it seemed like a very natural fit. Like we have students, we kind of have a captured audience, students taking health classes. They're already learning about substance misuse prevention. They're already learning about um, healthy coping skills to keep their physical health um, you know, well and maintain physical health. And knowing the um, interaction or the, the relationship between physical health and mental health, it only makes sense that we'd be teaching them those mental health strategies as well. So that's really where um, that came from. And, and what we learned was that many health teachers were already teaching students about mental health. It's hard to talk about um, relationships or, or your physical health or sleep or um, substance misuse without talking about mental health. So it was naturally happening. And I think what the law did was it provided an opportunity um, to elevate the conversation about mental health within the school systems. And, um, you know, even to bring it down to that kindergarten level, which it's very relatable when you think about social emotional learning and social emotional development, it's very similar. They're learning those kinds of coping strategies and, and self-awareness. Um, so it, it really felt like a very natural fit. Um, and, and that's, that's really what we've learned the last couple of years is that it's happening and this just gives it more um, attention, I think. Amy, what would you recommend to policymakers in other states from the things that you've learned in New York and the things that you saw that helped you implement the law? 
I think first start looking at um, what are the existing opportunities to bring mental health into the conversation in schools. So some um, states have regulations around social emotional learning, so it makes it a very good fit. Um, it, you could talk about it as part of physical health class. So just being aware of what the existing regulations are so that you can um, kind of create an opportunity. But I think the other piece is it really was important for us um, to involve our state office of mental health, um, to build relationships with our state office of mental health, our state education department, um, stakeholders, education professionals across the state. We have a great working relationship with the New York State School Counselors Association, school social workers, administrators. Um, everyone wants for sort of the same same goals is that students are um, are well and that they can learn and that they feel safe and that they feel connected. So it was really important that we have those conversations and, and build those relationships. Um, also, our affiliates were an amazing um, kind of access to our work because they understand at the local level the needs of the communities and the opportunities that exist there to work with schools. Super. Well, we've heard about how students are helping each other, how students are learning in school. Let's hear a little bit from um, Dr. Wakefield about access when kids need mental health services. Tell us about um, the programs um, that Texas lawmakers created to provide telehealth in schools and, and particularly around the needs of students um, of students of color who, who ordinarily might not be able to access services. Well, thank you. It's really exciting to get to talk about this. Um, Texas lawmakers, our legislators really wanted to do something big and bold uh, to address children's mental health and to help families with access to mental health care across our state. Uh, so the 86th legislature dedicated almost $100 million uh, to uh, improve children's mental health care across our state. Now, these were for several different programs, um, all of which had either a model within our state or a national model, and one of which is our school-based telehealth program um, and telemental health program. We are the the program called Texas Child Healthcare Access through Telemedicine, or T-CHAT is the acronym, um, is will be administered, it's being developed um, and administered through our health-related institutions, through the departments of psychiatry at our medical schools and health sciences centers across the state. Uh, and what this does is actually also improve the education to our psychiatry residents, our child and adolescent psychiatry fellows, and our medical students about these uh, this type of care and access issues and how to deliver this uh, efficient and effective uh, mod modality of care. Um, and telemedicine is increasing, and, um, and it is something that has allowed us out here in West Texas to really get care out to the schools where they need it. Um, when we, so we have actually had a program out here at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center in Lubbock since 2013. Our Rural and Community Health Institute, uh, under the direction of Dr. Billy Phillips, developed a program um, in response or in with some to the, the concerns about children's mental health and students' mental health and some of the things that were going on around the country. Uh, and so in 2013, developed this program to say, how can we get schools uh, access to assessments more quickly? How can we help support schools when they're concerned about a student and there are signs that the student may be having struggles um, or you know is, is at risk for uh, being a danger to themselves or others or, or just really struggling at school, maybe not showing up again, truancy, those types of things. Um, and so we started where our LPCs, our case managers or licensed professionals will go to the school and have a formalized assessment with the school with the parents consent. And, um, and then bring that information back and triage with a child psychiatrist. So that the very, and that happens within a week where a child psychiatrist can hear the case presented by a mental health professional and very quickly say, 
this really sounds like something that needs to be seen by a child psychiatrist right now, or this sounds like this child needs um, a certain therapy modality or a school-based intervention, and then provides that feedback back to the school. If the child needs telehealth, or, or I'm sorry, if the child needs a, is deemed to need a child psychiatry appointment, then that appointment is done via telehealth where the child stays at the school and the parent comes to the school. So when the student doesn't have to leave school, this really reduces the time that they're outside of school. It reduces the travel time for the parent um, and actually increases the interaction. Now, this is all if the parent and student want to share what's going on with the school professionals. It's still, we maintain privacy. But um, if they do, then that's very easy to do in that environment. They can bring the school counselor in. Um, we can share what's going on with the kiddo and really help the, the whole environment support the, the student um, in a more effective and efficient and earlier way. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to play phone phone tag with a teacher or administrator if you're seeing a child in your office, um, but we're all very, very busy and it can take weeks sometimes to make contact. So the, even when the parent wants you to do that and the student wants you to do it and you know that it will benefit them. So this is something that is facilitated much more quickly and we can help the student where they are. Um, so that that is basically our model. We've actually, and, and the model that um, the, the state has taken on to roll out across uh, the state from different health related institutions as well. In addition, we have um, an echo based project out here in West Texas uh, that we're also talking about rolling out statewide um, in conjunction with other health related institutions where um, administrators or counselors, usually at school counselors or teachers, could present and de identified, no identifiers, but just a general case, a general, um, I saw the student struggling, what, do, you know, here's what's going on, how do you think I can help them, um, and try to prevent actually the need for referral for a greater assessment or referral to a child psychiatrist and see if we can intervene even earlier. Uh, the goal is to keep that child, keep that student in their school environment and to not have a need for escalation of services if at all possible. But when there is a need to have those services available as soon as possible. That's wonderful, Dr. Wakefield. You, you just touched on one of the most important things um, that we think about at Mental Health America. Before stage four, we intervene as early as we possibly can and before crisis. Tell us a little bit more about like what the program costs and what the outcomes are and, and what you're seeing. Obviously, it's, it's helping kids and parents. You're educating uh, the uh, school personnel as well. Tell us a little bit more about that nitty gritty, please. Well, I think, so it, it's a little bit different um, the way this is being rolled out across the state because the budgets are different based on with which health-related institution is doing it and what way they're doing it and how many schools they're reaching. Um, and so I think we'll have more information on the cost of a statewide cost by the end of this fiscal year, maybe the end of the next fiscal year. Uh, like I said, the legislature dedicated $100 million to children's mental health for five different projects, and this is one project. We know that, that it is unlikely that we can serve every school across the state of Texas as, uh, with this amount of money, um, but what we wanted to do was serve the schools that we have relationships with and even expand it past that to see how much it costs per student um, and if we can roll this out for every school statewide. The echo Base project is much more, much less expensive than having a child psychiatrist available, um, you know, during school hours to, and enough child psychiatry capacity for all of the students who might need to be referred. And even to have the licensed professional counselors available to go to the school or respond to the school as soon as they call. So that is, that is, one, that is a model that we're doing right now. But we are very hopeful that actually the ECHO based project will, will decrease the number of referrals that would be made to um, that program, to the, the previous, the program that we're doing. And then in conjunction, they provide a continuum of services. Uh, so I think that the jury is out, that there are ways that we can actually reduce cost. When you're starting programs, they always cost more than they have to cost because you're, you're projecting things and you're building things and you're building relationships 
partnerships and seeing what technology is necessary. You know, we know in some parts of our state that we don't have the, the broadband infrastructure that we need. And so assessing those capacities is very important. Uh, but I do think that over the next two years, we will have a lot more information about what it costs to provide this continuum of services and how much um, the echo based project can actually decrease the overall cost and improve care um, for our entire community. Thank you, Dr. Wakefield. Um, I want to I want to ask Amy. Um, I want to follow up on some of the things that Dr. Wakefield talked about um, in terms of serving a diversity of students. Um, New York State is an extraordinarily uh, diverse student uh, state. You have uh, you know the big one of the biggest urban areas in the country in New York City. You have very rural areas in Western New York, and a little bit of everything in between. How do you ensure that um, as curriculum is rolled out across the state, it meets the diverse needs of students and it takes that into account? I think the first thing um, which has been really beneficial is that the, the law was not written to um, require schools to teach any particular curriculum. It was up to the schools to identify which curriculum they would like to use. Um, there were some recommendations and a framework that was provided uh, for schools. So that, that was key. Um, for us, from our the perspective of our resource center, um, we're funded through New York State Legislature and Executive. So it was really important to us that we find a way to meet the needs of the entire state. And as you said, um, there we're a very diverse state. I think I mentioned before the importance of relationships um, with stakeholder membership organizations. That was really helpful because that gave us connections to lots of people from across the state. Our affiliates are a great resource because they understand and know their communities. Um, so really leveraging communities was important making sure that when we were working with a school, they had an understanding of their own um, demographics and, and as well as the resources that are available in the community to help them. But I think that the other piece is really leveraging the voice of the people we serve. And that's why I think it's so wonderful that Ariana is on this call because we need to hear from the youth. We need to hear from staff. Um, we need to hear from communities to say, this is our needs, These, this is our perspective, these are our experiences. So when you listen to the people you're serving, you can better meet the needs of the people you're serving regardless of where they are. Thank you, Amy. Um, you, that leads right into the next question for Ariana. Um, so thank you so much for that. You know, talking about students' role here. How do the students, Ariana, how do they um, come into, you talked a little bit about the programs and how that helps provide support for other students, but what do you think students can do to help educate each other? And what do you think the school administration and policymakers can do to help that happen? Yes, I think that as students, we know what each other are going through and we, we, we go through the same experiences. Um, although there are, they are different in some ways, at the end of the day, we go through the same things. So it's our job to make sure that we're doing okay because we can't expect older generations to always understand what we're going through because of course we're different so we have to make sure that we're there for each other that we can support each other during um when we're going through something because again we are going through something unique um of course COVID is unique but i think the overall adolescent experience is something that um is, is quite different from the rest of your uh your life so i think the best thing that students can do is um for example, the Stand Up Act, which allows students to be able to be trained in suicide prevention and then use those skills to um, keep their peers um, mentally healthy so that, you know, if they're going through something, they have those supports. And that's where the connections part comes in, in my opinion. So I just think um, being there and then also support groups is another great way to get students the support that they need and students can do that on their own. Um, for example, the wellness calls, that was something me and my chapter came up with and our administrator um, uh, just like helped us put in motion. So I'm so um, happy to just let students know that yes, there are ways that you can help this cause. So my main two takeaways are make support groups um, for you and your friends and also just be the leader you are and get out there in the communities and just just 
let your light shine. Yes. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ariana. That was, that was wonderful. You are a tremendous advocate. How would you encourage other kids to do um, the kinds of things that you're doing in terms of advocating? I never take off my advocacy hat. So what do you, what do you say to your peers about how they can get other people as interested and passionate and excited as you are? Yes. So for other people that are interested in this kind of thing, my first recommendation is just to find a group of people who are like-minded. That's how I got into this. And I'm so happy that I did. Um, just find people who have the same kind of mindset in your community. And I know that that's not an option for everybody. So my second um, a piece of advice is be your own advocate and this is something I do on my own time you know on like for on your own social media just like post what you feel people need to know and what you feel about things that are affecting your life and are affecting people around you so be your own advocate and the right people will come to you um, great organizations will follow you and you'll just start getting involved and seek your hands into what advocacy really is, the nitty gritty of this amazingness. So I really, um, I would either recommend joining a group or getting those people to come to you through um, self-advocacy. So yes, I think that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Amy, uh, any advocacy tips um, for our fellow affiliates and our fellow folks out there in the world to get some terrific legislation like you have in New York? Well, I think uh, uh, what I was thinking about as Ariana was talking is we have a legislative advocacy day that we host every year. And um, the last couple of years, we've had the opportunity to engage school groups. Um, last year, we were expecting 750, or this year in March, we were expecting 750 people, um, students from about 25 different schools. And unfortunately, we had to, to cancel that. But I think that... Um, you know, we need to give young people an opportunity to to raise their voice um, and leverage their voice. So I I think that's really important. Thank you, panelists, for that really important discussion. And we will now take a four minute break for uh, our mental health. Please take some deep breaths. We'll be back soon with Dr. Patrice Harris, our next speaker, who you won't want to miss.
Welcome back. I'd like to introduce our next moderator, MHA's Executive Vice President, Mary Giliberti, who will have a fireside chat with the first Black woman president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, a nationally recognized advocate for children and a leader in promoting integration of mental health in public health and education settings. We are just so thrilled to have Dr. Patrice Harris um, talk with us today. Doctor, I cannot think of a better person to be discussing the themes of today, early intervention, prevention, and health equity. Dr. Harris is a child a psychiatrist and also just completed a highly successful term as the first black woman president of the American Medical Association. Dr. Harris has had an unbelievably incredible career serving children in her practice, also children in child welfare, juvenile justice. She has led a public health agency. And also relevant to our discussion today, I know Dr. Harris that you have also lobbied the Georgia legislature. So you are really an expert in health, mental health, children, and public policy. So welcome Dr. Harris. We are thrilled to have you with us today. Mary, and I'm so thrilled uh, to be with you and, and talk about the themes of uh, our, uh, our fireside chat today, because those themes are critical as we think about now and what is going on now, but also as we think about uh, the future post-COVID, because we have a lot of things on our to-do list when it comes to mental health. For sure. And I want to just start us off by talking a little bit about your personal journey, starting in coal country, West Virginia, um, and then becoming a child psychiatrist and um, moving into this incredible passion I know that you have for children's mental health and for all health and mental health. Can you talk a little bit about your journey to becoming this incredible advocate? Absolutely, and I'll give the uh, Cliff Notes uh, version, but certainly growing up in a small town in West Virginia, I was attracted to the profession of medicine uh, through a TV show. And uh, the younger viewers uh, in the audience will probably have to Google this, but uh, the older uh, viewers may remember a TV show called Marcus Welby, MD. And what I liked about Dr. Welby was uh, he not only cared about the patients inside the exam, his exam room, but he also cared about them outside of the exam room, and he cared about the community, and he also appeared to have a platform. And I remember thinking, uh, people listen to doctors, people listen to physicians, you know, in the broader community, and I had this passion to make change, and so I was attracted to a um, a career in medicine. Now, my original plan was to be a pediatrician. Uh, because I guess I've always been drawn to children. And I think, again, in, uh, in the spirit of the theme today of early intervention, I think I've always uh, marveled and thought about the promise of working with children where uh, there are opportunities to intervene early, no matter what the health issue is. And so I said, I want to be a pediatrician. And um, when I trained, uh, we did the first two years in the classroom, anatomy, physiology, all those things. And then you did your clerkships during the third year where you rotate through all of the, uh, uh, the major specialties. And I loved my pediatrics rotation. But when I got to my psychiatry rotation, I was so fascinated by, um, you know, the patients that I saw every day, something new. Um, I had always been fascinated since first year of medical school with the brain and neuroanatomy. And so I realized that I could combine uh, my newfound love of psychiatry with my long-term passion for working with children. And that's when I decided uh, that I would uh, combine those two and pursue a specialty of child and adolescent psychiatry. And, and I did also do an additional fellowship of forensic psychiatry. And the reason I added that fellowship uh, was because um, it was so important at the time. Uh, there was a, a move to, um, to uh, send uh, juveniles who had committed crimes, again, no excuses there, straight to superior court, adult court. And I knew that there was going to be a need for psychiatrists who had um, uh, expertise in both forensic psychiatry and child psychiatry. So I did that additional year of uh, fellowship training. 
Wow, incredible. Um, I know that during your service at AMA, health equity was a priority for you, and you even began a center for health equity at AMA, um, incredible accomplishment during your term. Can you speak to, we know even during COVID, we know that there have been um, really a highlighting of the equity issues in this country around health and people of color. And then even prior to the COVID crisis, for example, last year, the Congressional Black Caucus issued a groundbreaking report on uh, black youth suicide. Can you speak a little bit to those health equity issues, particularly in children's mental health for black youth and other youth of color? Well, I am certainly uh, so uh, proud of the American Medical Association and our commitment to health equity. And we did establish a center for health equity in 2019, and we did hire our first chief health equity officer. But I also want to take a moment here uh, to talk about history. Uh, because again, the establishment of the Center for Health Equity was based on a long history, or I would say built on a long history of work at the AMA regarding health disparities. Um, we had a commission to end health disparities for several years. That was a partnership with the National Medical Association and the National Hispanic Medical Association. And in building on that work, uh, we had policy passed by our House of Delegates. We're a very democratic organization uh, that asked that the Board of Trustees and I was chair of the Board of Trustees at the time the policy was passed, to sort of think about the next level, what we should be doing next. Yes, uh, let's build upon the work of our Commission in Health Disparities. Let's build upon the internal work that the AMA had done in apologizing uh, for not allowing uh, Black physicians to join, because that is also a piece uh, that has led to where we are now regarding health inequity. So with that history and that policy, the work of a task force, uh, we are now so very excited about forward, the next phase. Our center, um, of course, will lead the AMA internally and internally. But what we are really committed to is building and centering health equity within the DNA of our organization. And we want to model that because we believe that moving forward, that's what every organization is going to have to do, is center equity in their work. And it's not just about diversity, right? And not just about the numbers. Because the reason you want a more diverse physician workforce, speaking particularly for physicians, is you want to do that in the service of equity. So I'm so proud, though, to have been uh, the leader of the AMA in leadership um, in this, what I call a next phase of our journey. And I look forward to continued uh, work on this. And can you speak particularly to some of the health equity issues in children's mental health? So, you know, again, uh, COVID-19, and I think it's worth saying this, this has been said by me and many others, uh, that COVID-19 has really brought into stark relief several issues, right? And so health inequities uh, existed pre-COVID, um, and those inequities existed in mental health um, as well as a lot of other areas of, of health. And so pre-COVID, of course, and you know this, we've been concerned uh, about the increasing numbers of suicides in African-American youth, uh, particularly African-American males. We've been concerned about the inequitable access to mental health care for African-Americans in general, and particularly African-American youth. I have long been um, interested for over 20 years now in wanting to further understand uh, the effect of trauma, uh, particularly child maltreatment on brain development. And I remember about 20 years ago when I first started looking at the literature and this work, um, and I remember thinking, you know what, there is certainly... Um, an underdiagnosis, I thought, of post-traumatic stress disorder and a lack of understanding of trauma. And then, of course, now we know all the work uh, around the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences and trauma and how that affects health. Again, as you know, not just mental health, but overall health. And so these are just longstanding uh, health inequities regarding mental health. And again, I mentioned earlier our to-do list 
And certainly as we move forward, we need to address that now so that we can move ahead. And I'll say this now, we'll probably talk about this more later. Um, but what I, I want us to make sure that we are not predicting the doom and gloom or a mental health tsunami. Uh, we do know that we're seeing more uh, people through surveys endure symptoms. And so what we have to be about now is being prepared, right? It's not necessarily about predicting, um, but it's about being prepared and making sure we have a mental health system that is adequately resourced and funded. Because as you and I both know, and I'm sure many in the audience know, uh, we have a mental health infrastructure that has been underfunded and under-resourced for decades. And so now's the time for us to plan and prepare uh, to make sure we have a solid uh, mental health infrastructure going forward for children, absolutely, uh, but also for everyone. Mm -hmm. And one area of that infrastructure that I have heard you speak on, I know has been a priority for you, is integrating mental health and physical health care. Can you talk a little bit about that issue and why it's so important for children in this area of intervention early uh, prevention. Why is it so important that we think about integration and how does that relate to the infrastructure changes you were talking about? Yes, you know, in my inaugural address, which was in June of 2019, I talked about uh, amplifying uh, three issues. One was certainly about diversity of the physician workforce in the service of equity. Uh, the other was certainly amplifying the importance of understanding adverse childhood experiences and other uh, trauma. Uh, that certainly impacts overall health. And then I think we need to think more about solutions. And I am very solution uh, focused and have long uh, believed and actually actively worked to integrate mental health into overall health. For so many years, mental health has been, has been seen as separate and apart from health, right? And oftentimes, sort of the last thing on the, the list uh, that we talk about, but it's so important. And the data supports this, as, as you know, is that we on the front end bust these silos. I, I tell people that I'm a rabbit silo buster, but that's the first step, right? So once you break down the silos, then what? Then we have to weave and integrate really all aspects of health and all determinants of health into a forward-thinking solution. Otherwise, again, you come to these issues after the fact, and we won't get the health outcomes that we need. And I was very excited about work here we did in the county. I think we were a little ahead of our, our time where we not only integrated or were thinking about and talking about integrating uh, behavioral health, mental health, and primary care, um, as public health director, I said, let's integrate public health, right? Uh, because, you know, I saw that there were opportunities for our moms who were coming in um, and, and applying for WIC services. Uh, and they were often uh, there and maybe waiting. Let's ask them what other health needs they have, what other behavioral health needs they have. Let's also ask them what needs they have in regards to the social determinants of health. Do they have housing needs? What about employment needs? Um, and we also, I thought, did something uh, very forward thinking. We had a drop-in daycare because we had done some research and saw that a barrier for families coming in to receive services, no matter what services we provided at the county, uh, was uh, not having available daycare. So we had a drop-in daycare. So we really had a couple of facilities where all of these services were under one roof. Now, that is just one way to integrate. And I'm not saying that is just one model. There are lots of models, lots of ways. We know there's no one-size-fits-all approach. But listen, integration is key. And it's not only integrating uh, the health, traditional, I would say, health services, but also integrating all of the services. Now, I'm working with a group here um, in Atlanta, uh, the, uh, the ARCHA group. It's the Atlanta Regional Collaborative Health Improvement. And we talk about fundamentally, we need to invert the burden, right? In our systems now, all of our systems, the burden is on the person to navigate very complicated 
systems. And we believe with integration of systems, we can begin to invert the burden. The burden should be on us. The burden should be on us to make these systems easy to navigate so that folks can get the care that they need easily and equitably. Absolutely. And, you know, that is something we hear all the time in children's mental health, how hard it is to navigate, to find the services that you need when you need them. Um, that has certainly been a major barrier. So as I'm hearing you, it's really about integrating in all these other kinds of services as well as within healthcare. Um, and you talked earlier, and I know you have worked extensively with child welfare, juvenile justice, and you even spoke about sort of that uh, prison pipeline, if you will. Um, what are your thoughts and the outcomes we know in those systems around children's mental health are not good currently? What thoughts do you have about how we think about um, integration to avoid contact with some of those systems? And then if you do get involved, how do we best address mental health needs? Let's start even further back than that, because I certainly want to uh, get this out on the table. And you know this because you've heard me talk about, and of course, it's the theme of our, our chat today, early intervention. Yes. And when I talk about early intervention, I'm talking about, you know, three to six, early childhood, you know, even pre-kindergarten, pre-first grade. Let's um, develop systems and services uh, to promote socio-emotional health. I think that then provides a strong platform for, again, early intervention if needed, uh, but again, pro-development so that then um, our very youngest come to kindergarten or first grade prepared, not only academically, but emotionally, right? right? So we need to be teaching coping skills. And by the way, this is a family affair, right? So we uh, are, are, of course, involving the family, guardians, parents, grandparents, who's, who's ever in the, the, the children's lives. And so we start there um, so that, um, you know, they come again to school prepared to learn. We also think about the resources that they uh, need. And uh, by the way, and I, this is part of the conversation we're having now about school reopening. You know, we can talk yeah, about I was going to ask you about that for sure. Yes, but let's make sure we have the resources. And so then we can intervene early. I loved working with um, some uh, daycare centers here in Atlanta where the parents and the early childhood educators were able to identify issues early. And then they had us in the county, our child and adolescent team, as a resource. And so that's early. And then we can identify uh, particularly needed services. But here, Mary, is where the resources that are needed because uh, you and I and others could identify uh, what's needed. Uh, but then the challenge was oftentimes, too often, those services weren't available. And so, again, that's where bringing those uh, resources to bear so that children can learn, they can cope, they can regulate their emotion. If they have ADHD or PTSD or anything else, they can get treated, get their needs met. So, again, they can learn and, again, are not being suspended, right, or expelled or labeled as. Uh, children with problems, I hate labels, um, which we know all too often then starts a cascade, as you note, uh, contact with the juvenile justice system, out of school, and that just really is a cascade of issues that um, doesn't lead to where we, we want um, children to go. Absolutely. So it sounds like what you're saying is at the local, state, and federal level, we need to be integrating these services very early into child care, into early intervention, into all the programs that families touch. And then we need to worry about the schools as well and make sure that those services are well integrated into schools, um, but not with the idea of labeling or moving children, particularly out of school, which we see happen sometimes, but more treating them um, and helping them uh, so that they can be successful. Um, and thinking about, one more thing, thinking about that pre prevention services, I think we have to, here's, here's um, another area that I think we need to focus on, and that is how we pay for. Now, what you and I do, you know, you and I can get wonky here in the policy uh, area, but um, we should not have to, or a child should not have to have a diagnosis 
in order to get services, right? Um, so what we want to do, again, all this prevention work that you and I talk about and all the work that I just uh, mentioned uh, with a broad brush, um, we need to make sure children can receive those services um, even if they don't have a diagnosis. And, and that, again, is in part of the work of inverting the burden, part of the work of early intervention and, and prevention. Mm -hmm. So getting in early, but also not requiring, because sometimes the system is so diagnosis driven rather than sort of population health. And I think that's where your background as a public health leader comes, that you look at things from a population level. How do we intervene more broadly to avert problems later? Um, and I think that's really important as we discuss ACEs and trauma, you know, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity because I know trauma is something very important to you, something you've talked about, the need for more research, also the need for addressing it. Can you speak a little bit about some of the ways that you think we should be addressing that? It's particularly relevant now. So in so many ways, so certainly more research because uh, you and I know that it is so critical that um, our youth get evidence-based services. And lots of smart people have lots of good ideas, but those good ideas need to be tested, right? You can have good hypotheses and they need to be uh, tested so we know what works and what doesn't work. And then we can make sure that um, youth, everyone actually, evidence-based uh, treatment and interventions, and these are even uh, preventative, so it's not just this treatment per se, um, it is, is available. So we need to focus on the research, more uh, funding, uh, more attention to research so that we know what works. We also need to look at the workforce, right? Um, and this is workforce, not just physicians, uh, workforce on all levels, the therapists, the um, psychologists, um, bachelor's level uh, team members who I work with um, here in Atlanta. Um, we need to make sure that um, everyone is trained on trauma, uh, we talk a lot about trauma-informed care, again, future uh, research on that, but everyone gets the training. We want a workforce uh, to be able to be trained um, to identify this as something we could also train some of our teachers and early childhood educators on, on what to look for and how to respond. And again, how to have a trauma-informed school early childhood uh, education. Uh, and so I think that is so uh, critical and uh, we need the research and we need the funding to make sure um, our interventions are evidence-based and that we have a trained and prepared uh, workforce. And I know that one of the issues you have championed is making sure that children can receive care from people who share their racial, ethnic, language, other um, factors that are important uh, in treatment. Can you speak a little bit to how we create a future where particularly children of color see health and mental health as part of an area that they may want to pursue as a career? as you have. I know you've often said the responsibility of the first is not to be the last. And so this has been a real priority for you. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that as we wrap up our conversation. You know, it really has, you know, there's so many layers uh, to uh, why I considered the presidency of the AMA such a privilege. One, of course, as you noted, is the first African-American woman, um, but I'm the first child adolescent psychiatrist. And again, I thought that was sort of a nuanced way uh, for folks to say, okay, all right, psychiatrists, you know, you know, they are integrated here, right, in the overall house of medicine. So I thought that was important. But, but clearly, we need to make sure, as I talked about earlier, um, and as I mentioned in my inaugural address, that uh, we have an obligation, those of us in the physician community, uh, to make sure that the faces of our physicians uh, match the faces of our community. And, and we know that we have a long way to go. And that's important. You know, not to say, let me just make this clear, not to say that everyone does not need to be, uh, need to have the ability to offer what I'm calling culturally congruent care or culturally specific care, and everyone needs to be informed. But it does matter. You know, we, we've seen some of the data that shows that um, the care is better, the outcomes are better uh, when physicians, uh, when patients see uh, physicians, clinicians, therapists, psychologists, other folks who look like them. And, and I have to say, there is just something about um, the lived experience that I could share 
uh, with some of my patients that other colleagues can't. Again, still important for everyone to appreciate that, but, but that's critical. And so we, again, and I believe our work in early childhood education, I hope that for many, I've been an inspiration. We need to see more. Uh, we need to get, uh, we need to look at um, who's around the table making decisions on admissions committees, whether that's admission to medical school or to, uh, you know, schools of psychology to, to become masters prepared and, and uh, you know, to get your doctor, really nurses, all, all along the line, we need to make sure that every profession uh, has a commitment uh, to increasing diversity. Again, not just for the sake of a checkbox, not just for the sake of having numbers, but really that commitment to overall equity um, in the care that we provide. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. You are definitely an inspiration to all of us in the children's mental health field, and we so appreciate you taking the time today. Well, thank you, Mary. It was my pleasure, and uh, I love, love talking about these issues, so appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mary and Dr. Harris. We look forward to having you join the question and answer session at 2.45 p.m. So if you have a question for Dr. Harris, you can put it in the chat now, or if something comes along uh, through your mind, you can put it in the chat. Uh, we'll be sure that she gets a chance to answer it um, at the near the conclusion of the meeting. We will now hear from Sam Brinton, the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the Trevor Project. He's a leading advocate for youth and the Trevor Project is an organization that was founded to end suicide among gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth. They provide a national 24-hour toll-free confidential suicide prevention hotline for these youth. Take it away, Sam. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Brinton. I use they and them as my pronouns, and I serve as the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Trevor Project, the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention program for LGBTQ youth. It's my honor to get to speak with you today and provide remarks uh, at the MHA Policy Institute on how we can work together to save LGBT young lives. I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation. I'm gonna cover a few different major topics that keep coming up for the Trevor Project and the youth that we are serving. This is coming from um, hundreds of thousands of contacts who tell us these are the challenges that I'm facing. As you may know, LGBTQ youth are at higher risk of suicidal ideation and MHA's own LGBT um, screening and youth screening found that 86% of LGBTQ youth were screening positive or mild to severe for a mental health condition. So we have our work cut out for us, but there's plenty of things we can do right away. First off, let's talk about the issue of conversion therapy. I myself am a survivor of conversion therapy. It's a dangerous, discredited idea that you can change someone's sexual orientation and gender identity. And it is still legal in 30 states around the country. But there's many successes that have been happening. Recently, we've passed laws in Utah and Virginia making 20 states now who have banned conversion therapy for minors, a major victory. And federally, we have work that can still be done. We could call conversion therapy consumer fraud with the Federal Trade Commission and the Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act. We could make sure that no federal funding is going to conversion therapy with the prohibition of Medicaid funding conversion therapy act. So there is plenty to do to end conversion therapy and I hope you'll join me in those efforts. Second, we need to make sure that we're recognizing that LGBTQ youth are spending a lot of their time in school. And according to our Trevor Project research, they are less than half are out to a single individual in that school, but they would be more comfortable and would feel safer if there was a suicide prevention policy that included them as a high risk population. Sadly, we are finding that one third of schools do not even mention suicide prevention in their school policies. We have our work cut out for us and we can do it together. Ask your local school board or check in with your local state if there is a way to make sure that every student gets to go to a school with a suicide prevention policy in place. 
That leads us into data. I know I'm a nerd, a uh, graduate of MIT in nuclear engineering here, totally um, behind it, but it's a really important topic when it comes to the issues of LGBTQ youth and suicide prevention. We do not know how many LGBTQ youth die of suicide because we do not ask the questions in our death records and our violent death records. The National Violent Death Reporting System has optional variables around sexual orientation and gender identity, but they're not being filled out. So work with the LGBT Essential Data Act may be just the push we need to get the data to save lives. And that leads me to our culmination effort, 988. I'm sure you've all heard about it, but the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is changing to the number 988. How does this relate to LGBTQ youth, you may be asking? Well, millions more people will start calling 988 as it becomes the norm. As stigma um, around mental health conditions start to decrease as we have these conversations, it's important to recognize that LGBTQ youth may be calling 988 and they need to be served as well as possible. So passing the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act in the House, a critical step. Then we need to make sure that integrated voice response and transfers of LGBTQ youth from 988 to the Trevor Project or an LGBT serving organization are um, an immediate next step in implementation. Let's make sure that as we revolutionize mental health in this country, we don't leave those behind who need the help the most. Again, it is my honor to have been here with you. And I know that was a lot of different policy issues, each of which are going to bring unique perspectives and unique wins to LGBTQ youth but I hope that you can join me in all of them. If you wanna join uh, Trevor Project in some of our advocacy work, for example, in ending conversion therapy, you can text the word Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R, to the number 40649. And again, I am excited to continue the conversation with each and every one of you because it is not possible for us to end all of these awful, um, uh, awful challenges for LGBTQ youth alone. We need each other. And that's why I'm here to bring you these remarks. And that's why I'm grateful for your time. Have a great rest of your Policy Institute and let's save young LGBTQ lives. Thank you, Sam. We look forward to having you join our question and answer at 2.45. Uh, for participants who have questions for Sam, they can go ahead and put them in the chat now. I'd like to welcome Dr. Art McCoy, a dynamic speaker and advocate who serves as superintendent of Jennings School District in Missouri. He's a nationally recognized leader in, the meeting, <clears throat> in meeting the needs of the emotional and social needs of children, especially those who have experienced trauma. And he works with community partners to ensure an appropriate school response, not a law enforcement response to children with emotional needs. Dr. McCoy is taking questions immediately after his presentation. Please submit your questions for Dr. McCoy as they come to mind during his talk. Greetings, I'm Dr. Art McCoy, Superintendent of Jennings School District, and it is a pleasure to present to you today on education innovations with a mental health framework and equity framework. So it's all about equity and especially during COVID when schools have so many unique ch challenges that we currently face in our communities and our schools and beyond, I want to dig in for the next 25 minutes with you on innovative education strategies to address these challenges. So let me start by sharing some student voice and sharing my screen. This poem and the next poem were both written and shared and expressed by students, countless students. First one is at hard times. Grandma just died. There's no other family nearby. Feeling like Godzilla's pride because every two hours, one of us aspires from an act of violence. And during COVID, every seven minutes, someone aspires. So all I do is hide. Feeling empty inside. There's no understanding of these hard times. It doesn't even help to get high. Go to school? Can't. Go to church? Why? Don't deny that even if I could, it wouldn't help. There's too much pain, too much pride. Call it fate, but hate helped me just get by. But to my surprise, 
a new feeling has visited my mind. When all alone late at night, it seems justified. It's a suffocating feeling inside. And it says, I'm your savior. God? No. Suicide? Yes. Suicide. Now, knowing that over 73% of African-American males feel suicide tendencies now over the past 25 years and now becoming the first group, the highest group to perform uh, suicides or have suicides, that is poignant for millions of people, not just black males, but white males, females, and many more. We have to advocate and help all of our children and youth. The second expression is, who can I turn to? I'm a person lost in the world. I don't know where to turn. I'm a girl wanting to achieve at everything I do. I just want to be treated like I exist. I want to be seen for more than the person outside of me and the outside of me, but I want to be seen for the person inside of me. But I feel like I'm all alone in the world. I feel like there's no one or nowhere to turn to when I feel like it's the end of me. Sometimes I want to run away to a place where no one can hurt me or abuse me. Sometimes life for me will never go right. As much as I try, it just never will go right. So what should I do if the problems I face won't come up from this deep, dark place inside of me? Who can I turn to if I can't turn to the person who gave life to me? Who can I turn to? The answer has to be me and you, everybody. And those answers of me and you were the answers before COVID, which I call BC, and it's the answers are during COVID, which I call DC, and it's gonna be the answers after COVID, AC. Our life changed after March of 2020, or around March. And we're gonna be in this situation for some time until there's a vaccine, a cure that works and is trusted and free, or until there's herd immunity or a combination of both. So what do we do? We have to focus on Maslow's hierarchy taxonomy as education institutions. As a school system, I'm proud to tout that we've had four years of 100% graduation rates, career and college placement rates, with students getting jobs, paying living wages of $20 an hour in an area that has 98% African American population and 1% Hispanic and 100% free reduced lunch. A promise zone to the best degree, but we don't let our zip code define us. We have two homeless shelters, two grocery stores that we own and operate, two school-based health clinics that give all medical needs from dental, mental, and small surgeries, and much more. But it, it's a focus on the wraparound services that makes a difference. Focusing on Maslow's hierarchy being the psychological, the physiological needs, sleep, rest, so forth, water, food safety needs, a roof over your head, physical security, and then love and belonging. That leads to self-esteem. All of that's before you get to Bloom's taxonomy, which is a theory of learning, understanding knowledge, comprehending things, an analyzing things, um, and ultimately synthesizing and making judgments through evaluation. That's important, but Maslow's before Bloom. So we're proud to know that that has been a success in our district, and it's now even more important. These are our health-based school clinics that you see at the elementary, middle school level. These are our homeless shelters that you see, rooms that we shelter over 50. I love that we have comfort spaces in every school, two of them, one for adults and one for children, because we must be centers for healing engagement. Ultimately, we have gardens at every school, Ms. Leslie McSpadden and my board members helped to make sure that it just didn't end with the tragic death of Mike Brown, her son, but we created new vegetables and fruits working with organizations like the St. Louis County Police Department and more. Students deliver food and groceries. They have a sense of belonging and adult champions. That's the last C. It's computers, connectivity, and every child deserves a champion and a life coach. I'm so proud of our students for having that and for becoming workers, wonder kinds. But it ultimately takes a focus. And that focus includes shifting from me, myself, and I, which is often a great contribution to the illness that goes on, the isolation, to a concept of we, 
for wellness. If you change that one letter of I to the we, you have illness changing to wellness. And we are proud to be we schools where all of our students do service learning as seen on the screen. But we're proud to have we teachers in partnership with the Mental Health America so that teachers are trained on mental health, on trauma, and they get a grounding and understanding of how to build resilience. And it's a natural part of our required professional development and for our teachers to help other adults, parents, and more. During COVID, DC, this is so essential because we saw that over 33% of our children across the nation, based off of the data, have become worried. They have trauma and anxiety just related to COVID. 17% are afraid to even go outside. Young children ages five and four and three hide in their rooms and hide their faces. Learning is twice as long because of the isolation and the disengagement the cognitive processes are reducing. So that's the data. But what do you do to change this structurally, systematically, policy-oriented? Well, seat time for credit. If you can't sit in the seat in school, there's no seat time anymore. Uh, you have to change to 24-hour learning, to asynchronistic learning and synchronistic learning, virtual learning environments, making school centers for healing engagement, community centers, where people can go six or seven days a week to get anything from food to mental health to a life coach to a person who will help heal them. I'm proud to know that we were one of the only schools, we were the only school in St. Louis County and city in a high zip code for COVID that opened our schools for those who were facing neglect, for court adjudicated kids, for students who were homeless because we have two homeless shelters, for those who had disabilities. We said we will become contact tracers and we have a quarter of our staff as contact tracers. We're the first to write the plan, get it approved and have in-person summer school in June, July. Because we understand because of those efforts and more, and from our parent-child interaction therapy, the only in the state of Missouri, and one of four throughout the nation, that the way your synapses are, are, are accumulated in the earliest years, that's called synaptivity density, it can be a permanent thing if you don't have resilience training and skill training early on to understand how a parent should interact with a child who may be facing cognitive difficulties with their executive lobe functions, their executive functions in their frontal lobe cortex. So we've engaged our top neediest 100 families to have EEGs placed on them to see that amygdala light up versus your critical thinking frontal lobe light up when you've been given the appropriate mental health and resiliency skills and therapeutic training to understand focus, perception making and taking, communication, and both the child and the student grow and their life is forever changed. These activities must become a part of our policies and procedures across the nation in order for us to truly survive during COVID and thrive after COVID AC. We have focused every school on having social emotional learning curricula and professional development that focuses on self-management, self-awareness, self and responsibilities of decision making in your relationships. That's why Maslow's comes before Bloom's. These are the core components that every kindergartner and even preschooler should start with, with learning through play, learning social interaction with an awareness of yourself. Also understanding biofeedback and what your body is saying. If you become nervous, anxious, want to hide, if your heart rate increases and so forth. Or if you see protests in the street, that you have the power through adults to actually lead a student march against police brutality like our students did. March through the streets, let your voice be heard. Because ultimately every policy and every place should be a center for healing engagement by saying, I see you, young people. I see you, young adult. I support you in your wellness, your well-being. You are sufficient. And if you aren't sufficient, then we are sufficiently able to be more today than we were yesterday. Those are the strategies. But ultimately, seven key recommendations are essential. And they're taken from the premise of some very key work because we can't settle for small change after you've had over a million feet in the streets protesting after the death of George Floyd, we can't settle for small change. We need big bills, bills in Congress, but bills in dollars, funding. I love the policy and totally support the statements of the Mental Health America organization, but the policy and actual bill 
5469, Pursuing Equity in Mental Health Act. It definitely supports these changes. We must first become adaptive and understand that we have to change our assumptions, change our attitudes, our behaviors, our beliefs, and our culture and climate. Those are the ABCs to the policies that must be written. It has to deal with an attitude towards screening and having identification of who needs things the most, very intentional to the places in need, focusing on the heart, head, and hand. It has to be evidence-based work that works. It requires PD and training. That's why I'm so glad that over five years ago, after Mike Brown's death and with working with the police department, we signed an MOU that said you will not marginalize nor victimize our students, police. You're here to protect and serve. No arrest shall occur without the permission of the building principal in any school property. You will be trained in cultural, in cultural competency. You will be trained in trauma-informed practices. You will become a center for healing engagement as volunteers in the streets and in our basketball courts and, and, and everywhere else, in our gardens, to volunteer to help show that a student can become a cop like you. You should not get involved in anything that's not physical or not illegal unless you're being a positive life coach. That's professional development training for all adults, not just the teachers, but also the partners that work with you, like police officers and MOUs and memorandums supported by the ACLU with much data and, and, and more ways to help it mat matter and happen in communities that need it most. Number five, focusing on Maslow's hierarchy over Bloom's taxonomy is so essential. That means that when you do get to instruction, it has to be relevant to the person's life. But you have to first say that I care about you. So you have to show that you have heart, which is what Maslow's hierarchy needs says. Do you see me? Do you have a heart to help empower me? And now that, you, that I know that you care, now I care about what you know and what you want me to know. Focus on students first in education institutions. That means look for those with high needs. Make it a positive environment with positive engagement. That's what healing engagement is all about. Restoration, restorative justice, empowerment, making sure that you hear the voices of the youth as we started this presentation with. And lastly, making sure that it's a safe environment for learning and a safe environment for all. There's secondary trauma that's very real. And so how do you put that in place? Create safety when people the nervous they have biofeedback and understand what their body's saying. Make sure there's connections and relationships. Understand, understand that you have to have support and professional development. It has to be coherent, intentional, and a part of what you do, the development. Focus on power skills. How do you disseminate power and empower people to have more power over their own reality, their own thoughts, their own reality, their own actions, their own culture? Resiliency is a huge piece of this because we can do anything. If we shift that I that often is at the front of any illness to a we together, then we have the power, we have the resilience. We can put resilience back into the hearts of people who feel hopeless, just like those who may be facing suicidal thoughts and then continue to foster post-traumatic growth. That means it's okay not being okay. It's okay to road test your feelings and emotions. We need policy and make a normal part of what we do. It's okay to self-soothe. We must get active. We must celebrate resilience because it's there and we must seek community. Not just seek it, but establish it, create it so that no one feels like an imposter, not in their own home, not in their own school, not in their own neighborhood or community. We must seek and create the community that we deserve. So I'll close with saying that we have everything that we need to succeed. We are our current solutions that we've been waiting for. And now it's time to just get to work with intentionality, knowing that we need no more small change. It's time for some big bills and big action to make it a better day. Thank you for your time. I look forward to some questions and answers. <laughs> Thank you so much for your remarks, Dr. McCoy. Um, welcome. We're glad to have you here for question and answer. Um, I was speaking with a, a, a restorative justice advocate for the Montgomery County school system in Maryland. 
Um, and she recommends some of the some very similar things that you mentioned today that um, as students return to school, uh, policy should be put in place to ensure that it's not a business as usual environment, um, ignoring kind of the, the, the current events and, and kind of the environment that students are in right now. Um, and that there should be a continuum of restorative practices, uh, not unlike your healing centers that you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about how you've worked with the community to install these centers and ensure that students uh, feel they have a safe space at your schools? Sure. Uh, first, it's great to see you, uh, Ms. Howard, and it's always a pleasure to be with uh, your organization. Uh, so first, I'll share students are lie detectors. They know when an adult is pulling wool over their eyes. And the last thing you want to do is to act like COVID doesn't exist or like nothing's changed because the truth and reality shows the opposite. You will lose credibility the moment you do that as an adult or as a system. So what you have to do is work with organizations to uh, lean into the discomfortable things, lean into the truth of the matters, get feedback constantly from your population, do a needs assessment that's either like direct on the street, asking a person, how can I help you? What do you need? Or that's also by paper, pencil. Begin to set up places that become feedback loops for homes, for uh, community centers, for even your schools, even if they're closed, create feedback loops. But ultimately, you, you, you're you stronger together. So you there are partners that are already engaged in wellness, in uh, trauma-informed practices, uh, in, in safety, uh, in wellness, in gardening, and so forth. So look for those partners and don't reinvent the wheel. Begin to give them some space in your place. And so bottom line is to become in a center for healing engagement or for restoring justice is to, if you have power, to look for some space in your place or some space in your policy and procedures so that you fit in those solutions and you ultimately are empowering the people that already exist that have organizations. You're enlightening the community to what's available and you're engaging everyone to work together. Those are the three key strategies, uh, empowering those powerful practices and, and scientifically proven uh, practices and places, and then engaging and enlightening individuals that they're there to, to take part of it. Thank you. Um, it sounds like you're an expert on working with uh, community agencies um, since your students have a you know, 100% graduation rate, they're graduating with trade school jobs or tech jobs or going to college. Um, can you tell us though about um, particular uh, policy changes that need to happen um, still because uh, you know, black and indigenous and other youth of color are being left behind with the current system? Yes, definitely. Yes. A few things. One is uh, competency based learning policies. Some states still don't allow competency based learning. What does that mean? Uh, that means that if a student is already competent in algebra, they need to be able to take the exam, the final exam for that whole course in the first week, first day of school, first week after reviewing some. And if they make a 70 percent, they get a pass. If they make an 80 percent, a B. If they make a 90 percent, an A. That allows you to accelerate that child into the next grade or the next class based off of their competency immediately without seat time. So that's one policy. The second thing is that our school systems are paid by taxpayer dollars. So it should make the public schools are at least and even the private ones have some philanthropic dollars that are businesses and corporations. So this, the systems and the policy should allow for CTE, career technical education, that allows for your junior and senior year to include learning and earning. So basically the uh, a year or half a year should be built in for actual learning trade skills, but not just that, power skills, entrepreneurship skills, so that you can be a producer and not just a consumer, because ultimately jobs equate to mental health. When you have the ability to meet your safety needs, meet your physiological needs, you feel better about yourself. So if you have a living wage and the skill set to earn a living wage, you have better mental health. The data shows it, research shows it. So ultimately policy is needed that implements that as a part of the senior year. That is so essential during COVID when many people are laid off, millions, and older individuals with experience are taking entry-level jobs, rightfully so, just so that they can exist. Well, we need policies that allow for a safe space for seniors and juniors 
to be able to practice micro enterprises, entrepreneurship skills, and get paid small stipends for it as a built in part of their earning and learning in their high school education. So that's what we've done in our incubator, but that's what states can do with statewide education policy, also workforce development policies, federal workforce development policies, and more. Um, you have a, a lot of questions coming in and only about a minute left. Uh, can you share uh, <laughs> what would be uh, your I'm recommendation scared. for other advocates uh, as, as parents, as community leaders, as um, direct service providers, as um, even, uh, you know, everyday folks, how can they get involved in, in ensuring that the school board or the local folks in their community are, are engaging in a way that is not leaving certain students behind? That's great. Great question. Hard question with a minute. There's two forms of power. Everything boils down to power. Even racism boils down to power. Sexism, uh, discrimination, behind all of that oppression is power. So you have power. That's what you have to understand. You have influential power and you have some authoritative power, especially if you have a job anywhere. So you look for your circle of influence in your job and that's your authoritative power. If you're a supervisor or boss or you come as a representative of the organization, know what your organization stands for and push other people in power to endorse what your organization stands for. That's authoritatively within your organization. But then influentially, you are a citizen and anybody who's a paid taxpayer, uh, a tax paid leader. So any congressman, any city hall person, any board person, any president, they have an obligation to hear you, to see you and then to respond to you. And especially if there are thousands of you, then ultimately the, the deal is to never stay quiet, never shut up, never leave it alone. Always feel empowered to let people know that you all are paid to move at the speed of the need by my taxpayer dollars. So you use your influence to help urge them to move at the speed of the need and you use your organizational authoritative power to say, yeah, we're going to together move at the speed of the need. Otherwise, there'll be some shifts in your your funding and support <laughs> so that so never be ashamed. Live out loud. Now's the time we need you. Um, that's excellent. Do you have any last words or remarks? Because I think everyone is really engaged in what you're saying. We're asking or we're being asked if your slides, can, your slideshow presentation will be available to people after the event. Um, yes. How would you like to close out? I would just like to close out really organically in saying this. Some people are in survival mode and some people are trying to be in solution mode and maybe even narrow minded as, as they try to solve one problem. Please advocate for what you see because tunnel vision will hurt us. So there's a lot of discussion on getting kids more computers. That's great. But there's more C's than computers, getting them connectivity, broadband. That's great. But none of that means a hill of beans if you don't have life coaches to help you navigate these uncharted waters and champions that will advocate for change and social justice. So be that life coach, be that champion for kids and for communities. That's my closing remarks to each of you. Thank you so much, Dr. McCoy. What a dynamic speaker. We really um, appreciate you taking the time to be here live today as well as uh, making pre-recorded remarks. Let's uh, definitely keep in touch and we look forward to working with you in the future. I look forward to working <laughs> with you. I look forward to it. Have a great rest of the day in conference. Thank you. Uh, we will now uh, break until 2.10, at which time our, our final panel, oh, sorry about that. Let me uh, introduce Colleen, and uh, Colleen Riley will talk about perinatal mental health here. <laughs> Hello all. Thank you, Mental Health America, for the opportunity to share the Mind the Gap initiative. An initiative to ensure perinatal mental health is a national priority. On behalf of Postpartum Support International, I'm Colleen Riley, president of the Riley Group, and I also serve as director of Mind the Gap. I want to give a shout out to my friends and colleagues from the Mental Health America Network. As a former MHA'er, I've had the great honor of working with leaders across the country 
and I'm always inspired by the excellent work that you do. Postpartum Support International, or PSI, is leading the Mind the Gap initiative in partnership with Mental Health America and other professional and advocacy organizations. If you don't know PSI, I really urge you to connect with them. They, they are the largest organization devoted to perinatal mental health with chapters in every state across the country. PSI offers education and support groups to families at no cost in English and Spanish. They provide training to frontline healthcare workers. They advocate for policies through the Mind the Gap initiative. This initiative is a coalition of 30 organizations who've come together and outlined policies in a recently released national report. The report includes a gap analysis and actions that together we can take to bridge those gaps. So what are the gaps? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are the number one complication of birth, and this is not generally known. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have reported that untreated mental health conditions were the second leading cause of death in women 43 days up to one year after delivery. 50% of women who even get a diagnosis do not get treatment. Women with untreated depression are at risk of delivering premature babies and postpartum depression hinders infant bonding and attachment, leading to developmental disorders. Untreated and unaddressed, these mental health issues not only affect women, they have a cascading impact on the health of infants, children, and families. We can do so much better. The coalition came together and reviewed the landscape analysis to determine policy recommendations going forward. Some key policies include increasing awareness about the impact of untreated perinatal mental health among policymakers, increasing investment in training and educating our healthcare workforce, establishing a maternal mental health 24 hour hotline, which is a current bill in Congress, ensuring perinatal mental health care is a priority in public and private insurance, and Medicaid covers women a full year postpartum and coverage. Coverage means that women are routinely screened during pregnancy and postpartum and have access to a diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment. Another important legislative opportunity is the Momnibus legislative package, which is promoting black maternal health and mental health in 2020 and beyond. The package includes nine specific bills, such as a bill led by Congressman Joe Kennedy focused on maternal behavioral health care. PSI and the Mind the Gap Coalition are working together to make these policies a reality through hosting coalition meetings to tackle advocacy actions. The Mind the Gap initiative is also convening state meetings to engage stakeholders, build awareness, promote best practices in the healthcare systems, and galvanize community engagement. We invite you to join us. Go to postpartum.net to get the Mind the Gap National Report. Share it with your colleagues to help spread the word. And when you're at the site, please sign the pledge to support mothers, infants, fathers, partners, and families' mental health and well-being. By signing the pledge, this will be a way for us to contact you to join us in advocacy and be a part of the state meetings. We look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you, and thank you for all the work that you're doing to support mothers and families. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope that you found the perinatal um, report recommendations helpful. Um, on behalf of Postpartum Support International, MHA is uh, kind of helping to move the recommendations from the Mind the Gap report and put those recommendations in front of Congress. Um, if you'd like to partner up or work more on that together, uh, please let us know. We do have um, some, some direct information about downloading the report where you can find everything. Uh, now we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with our final panel and our last Q&A session. Um, where the panel will address workforce development and financing.
everyone. Welcome back. Um, please welcome our next moderator, Dr. Anita Burgos. Uh, Dr. Burgos is a senior policy analyst for the Bipartisan Policy Center and previously worked on healthcare policy with U.S. Senator Tina Smith from Minnesota as a AAAS fellow. That's the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Prior to health policy, Anita obtained her PhD in neuroscience, and in addition is the primary caregiver of a family member with serious mental illness and has seen firsthand the impact that our fragmented mental health system has on individuals living with mental illness and their families. We will now hear from Dr. Burgos and three great panelists. Thanks, Karen, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today uh, to moderate this panel and to be here with, with all these experts that we're going to hear from. So um, today, there, we've heard from experts and leaders in the field um, about how to really get in there early and um, detect both for detection and early intervention in children and youth so we can we can kind of sort of stop um, mental illness before it's too late. So uh, I want to today build on those conversations that we've been having to really focus on three things, workforce development, um, payment policy, and equity. So to put those three things in, into context, I want to sort of take a step back first. Our, our country and our children and youth are hurting right now. Um, a recent CDC survey found that four in 10 Americans are, are experiencing mental health challenges at this very, at this very moment. Um, the numbers are even more striking for, um, for, children, for, for youth. So in age groups of 18 to 24, 75% of respondents uh, said that they were experiencing mental health care challenges. And so essentially what that means is that someone that who we know and love right now is experiencing is having a hard time. And we really need a mental health care system that can keep up with the times and keep up with the, with the shifting crises. And so um, my work at the Bipartisan Policy Center where we're, where we're focusing on integrating primary care and behavioral health care better, as well as my personal experience with my mother who is a Latin American immigrant who's living with mental health care, with a serious mental illness, has really shown me that, what, that two things are, are absolutely crucial. One is that you need a workforce that is as diverse as the people who it serves and has a cultural um, understanding of where patients are coming from. And secondly, we need a payment system that really values, that values cultural responsiveness, that values a, a, work, a workforce that is, um, that is diverse. And, um, and so those are really the issues that we're going to be talking about today. And I'm really excited to have all these panelists here who are not only providers, so we have primary care and mental health providers on the panel, but we also have experts. So they're policy experts as well and can really talk, talk about from a practical and um, a policy perspective what it means to have uh, increased workforce development, in, in, uh, improved payment policies, and equity. So um, with that, I want to take a, a, just a reminder. So for the audience, for folks who want to be involved in the conversation, um, you can use the Twitter handle Mental Health AM or um, the hashtag, hashtag, let me make sure I'm getting this right, MHA Policy 2020 or hashtag B, the number four, stage four. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to the panelists so they can begin introducing themselves. They'll give a brief introduction about sort of where they work, how their um, work relates to the three themes that we're talking about today. So I will turn it over to Dr. Mutha for an introduction. Great. Thank you so much. I am really delighted to be here today. Um, I am Sunita Mutha. I direct Health Force Center at the University of California, San Francisco where I'm also a professor of medicine and a primary care physician. I lead Health Force's efforts to generate knowledge about the healthcare workforce that assists providers, policymakers, and funders in addressing critical healthcare challenges. Our organization has a team of nationally recognized research experts who work to understand, defining, understand and define issues that influence health policy with a rigorous analysis and actionable, unbiased data. I have, have spent the last two decades really focused on workforce and on cultural competence and on creating leadership programs for emerging to executive healthcare leaders. And I really look forward to this conversation to focus on the underpinning 
of all of this work, which is how do we have the workforce that is needed to address these issues? That's great. Looking forward to, to that discussion. And so, uh, Dr. Mohimi. Thanks, Nina. My name is Dr. Ibar Mogini. I'm a psychiatrist and the Chief Psychiatric Medical Officer for Healthcare Talk DC. We are the largest Medicaid managed care organization in Washington, DC. Uh, we serve about 120,000 members, uh, half pediatric, half adults. And um, part of what our strategy and approach is always trying to figure out is to go upstream and address. Um, the 80 percent of uh, social determinants that we know are actually the actual drivers of our healthcare uh, costs and outcomes. So, as a part of that, we've implemented a lot of strategies around social determinant assessments, value-based care programs that are looking at how to integrate social services into health services, and innovative kind of. Um, what I call sort of value-added benefits for our members for accessing behavioral health in non-traditional settings. So happy to talk more about that as we move on into the panel. Thanks. Yes, we will definitely be getting into that. So looking forward to the discussion. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Royland. Hi, yes, I'm Rachel Royland, and I'm a research associate with the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. And I work on the team that looks at payment and delivery reform. Specifically, we look at how value-based payment models could be better designed and implemented to address the shortcomings of the traditionally fee-for-service payment system that a lot of our healthcare system is based on. And uh, our particular sort of uh, uh, applicability for today's conversation is that we recently completed a project um, with the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities as well as Mental Health America's own Nathaniel Counts, um, looking at how we could provide guidance to the field on how to actually design alternative payment models uh, to better address sort of the full complement of children's developmental, social, medical, mental, and behavioral health needs. And so I think uh, working on that project, we saw that there's um, a lot of great examples out there of people that are trying to make strides towards developing a payment model that um, helps make sort of the, the uh, integration of all these types of services more feasible and long lasting, um, and also just identified a number of challenges as well. But um, there's there's a lot of great work happening, a lot of potential, and I think uh, getting those payment policies right uh, is, is a big key to making sure that the, the care models that so many folks go into developing and that so many folks um, work in are sustainable and effective for the future. So looking forward to the discussion. That's great, thank you. We're also looking forward to the discussion. I think kind of, um, I wanna, start off with talking about workforce development. Um, so for Dr. Mutha, um, as, as you mentioned, you're sort of, you've dedicated a lot of, of, of your career to looking into workforce development and cultural competency. And so um, can you talk a little bit about how we can develop the workforce uh, to address the escalating mental health needs of children during COVID-19, both from the perspective of increasing diverse providers, but also tra uh, training existing providers? Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a step back for just a moment and talk a little bit about some of the workforce issues just to frame my response. And the first is uh, that workforce is really foundational. It makes access real um, and it's, a, it's necessary for high quality outcomes. And when we talk about workforce, there's one probably important thing to know is that the workforce is not equitably distributed particularly in rural areas where access is greatly limited because of the workforce. And, and also when we talk about workforce, we're talking about quite a diverse group of individuals. There are the licensed professionals that we typically think about, psychologists, psychiatrists, marriage family therapists, social workers, psychiatric mental health nurses, and then there are the certified professionals. These are everything from peer providers to case managers to psychiatric aides and technicians, and there's more. And what's interesting is that actually much of, of mental health care in our country is still delivered by primary care clinicians because we have such a distribution problem of the availability of psychiatrists and other skilled professionals. And, and one thing to know, just to make that really clear, is that more than 60% of Americans live in an area that is underserved in terms of health professionals. And in these um, HPSA areas, we have you know, fewer than 10% of the psychologists and psychiatrists in these areas. 
So 65% of people get their mental health care from a primary care provider. And in some cases, the mental health crisis responder is often law enforcement officer. So that's just to help frame what their response is. And then I'll, let me answer your question about what do we do in this setting? And I think there are actually four things that we can think about and, and some are already in play. And the reality is that there's a need for a multi-pronged approach overall. The need is now, there's also a need, so there's a need for rapid actions, but there's also a need to think about longer term actions. So the four strategies, we have to ensure that our workforce mirrors the population being served. We know that the clinicians who reflect the population served ethnically, racially, and linguistically contribute to better engagement and better care and better outcomes. And this is a challenge that's exacerbated for the workforce that addresses mental health needs of children. We just don't have the diversity currently that we would like to see in most of our workforce. So the second issue beyond mirroring the work, uh, mirroring the patients that we are caring for and the clients is to train clinicians so they're already skilled in bridging the divide when there's not concordance, when there isn't a mirroring at racially, ethnically, or linguistically. And specifically, this means training people in communication skills, in knowledge about the communities being served and traditions, and one example is that we know that in, in some cultures, mental health is described differently. Conditions are described differently in what we say is a culturally bound way um, and may not have the symptoms that we typically think about or present the typical way. Um, and it also, I believe, includes training leaders who are committed to working on improving access to care. A third way is to expand the care team. Not everyone seeking care has the same level or type of need. One effective population-based strategy is to assess that, what that need is. Is it a low acuity? Is it a high acuity? Is it severe? And then to try to use a larger team to be able to serve those needs. And that might consist of a team that includes peer providers. It might include mental health nurse practitioners and different types of trained and certified or licensed clinicians. And these team members, interestingly enough, often mirror the populations that are being served and so already have some of the diversity that we would like to see and know that is necessary for effective care. So integrating these healthcare team members into organizations that are also based in community and community organizations do have a role, I believe, in addressing this need. And that includes some faith-based organizations that provide support services to families. Um, and the, the fourth strategy is to leverage technology in ways, and the ones that we're seeing that I think are really exciting and show some potential is self-management options for the less acute, less serious mental health conditions, and then telehealth to increase the reach of existing clinicians. So using models like Project ECHO and others where we take a limited resource of clinicians that are skilled and trained and increase the populations who they're able to serve in regions where families may otherwise have to travel great distances to access care. And these, of course, and I think we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit later, is that this requires an investment in infrastructure, in training, and in reimbursement to make this a feasible option. So four strategies that I think are really critical and they're multi-pronged, some already in place, and others that need greater investment. Yeah, I think you made some some excellent points there, and I think there are many things that we'll end up circling back to. Um, just from a personal note, uh, as you were speaking about that, I thought again of my mother, and I've seen her care when it's not integrated and when it's integrated, especially with uh, a, a diverse group of people who looks and speaks her language, and it is, you know, like night and day. And I see that she's her patient engagement has gone up. She's more independent. I, as a caregiver, can take a step back. So I think that is absolutely in line with like my with my experience as well. So so I was happy to hear you bring up some of those points, Dr. Mutha. Um, so I think we're we're starting. We were talking a little bit more kind of in the in the clinical perspective, right? Like uh, between patient or, and provider. Um, but I also want to get at something that Dr. Mohini brought up, which is um, how a lot of I think you said up to eighty percent of, of factors that. In, influence health aren't really happening at the, at, the cl at the level of the clinic. They're happening outside the clinic doors. And so I wanted to kind of get into that a little bit more. Um, so uh, can you, Dr. Mokimi, describe what the social determinants of health have, the, which ones have the greatest influence on children's mental health? 
um, and how we can create services and financial incentives to meet these needs and improve mental health. Sure, Anita. Um, yeah, just to take a step back, I think when you think about a, a payer, historically, we're responding to the information that we receive, which is generally claims-based information, which is, you know, uh, this member went to go see this provider, they had this diagnosis, they had um, these codes were submitted, and generally, uh, historically, that was kind of where we were starting, where we were responding to that information. So basically, um, uh, in that model, it's hard to know, uh, to really be able to intervene early in terms of some uh, working with folks who maybe are uh, not having diagnosis yet, not getting hospitalized yet. So one of the ways that we, we're really trying to shift that model to think more early intervention and, and preventative care is, uh, and because we're a Medicaid health plan, we know that many of our members are dealing with a wide range of social uh, determinants of health issues, whether that's housing, education, health literacy, transportation, food insecurity. Um, so I can't really say that for each and be unique to them, what, whatever issues that they're dealing with that are impacting their ability to maintain their child or their family's health. So um, there's two, uh, well, a couple different ways that I think we're trying to capture that information so that we can act upon it. One is that, uh, you know, internally within our care management team, we have uh, developed a social determinant assessment tool which is uh, parallels uh, a tool that's used in a lot of uh, national community health centers, the prepare tool, which really looks at a lot of those domains that I just mentioned earlier, the education, transportation, health literacy, housing, financial, and kind of categorizes them into an area of, you know, vulnerable, risk, um, stable. And, and in all of those categories, we have, our case managers have, resources or, or an ability to refer through um, either a platform like Punk Bertha or, you know, just existing community uh, resources that we're connected with so that we know we're finding a way to address these uh, issues that are not showing up traditionally in claims information. Um, the, other, the other approach is that we are trying to have that information show up through claims because for, for a long time, there has been an ability for providers to use Z codes, which are specific to social determinants, so that uh, it is showing up in a medical record system. Now, it's not easy to get providers to uh, make that shift and add those codes to a busy visit. They're, they're focused on addressing all the medical issues and maybe are not necessarily thinking it's important to add the specific codes that are um, explaining the social issues that the families are dealing with. So we try to incentivize that through value-based programs and, and basically acknowledge that, you know, if you're a provider that's able to really capture that information, you know, you can see a financial impact for that on a per per month basis for your panel. So um, that's a part of that shift from fee for service to value-based care. And so we really want to have social determinants be a part of that shift so that it's also uh, causing the health systems and the providers to think differently about what's the information that I want to capture in this medical visit. Um, and lastly, I guess, uh, to, to build on my doctor thing, I was really appreciating everything she was saying about integrating the peers into the care team. And, you know, there's, we're still at a point where we need to figure out in payment reform, how to really recognize peer specialists, peer, uh, th their worth and their value in, in the health system and how they can be reimbursed for the services. Um, so one of the approaches that we're looking at, particularly now as we're really evaluating our telehealth strategy, um, the, we, we've recognized you know, during COVID, everything's changed with virtual care and the need for telehealth is we're, we're looking at behavioral health providers who can provide telehealth with licensed providers, but we're really looking for behavioral health providers that can provide telehealth through, through coaching as well, through um, text-based uh, ways of communicating with members, because we know that that's 
a modality that most of our members feel comfortable with, particularly our youth. They love SMS as a way of connecting to each other, and, and it's a viable way for them to connect with um, mental health professionals or peers that can really help them at an earlier access point. So we're trying to not fit, have everyone fit into a one-size-fits-all mental health care um, model, and, and um, I think part of those having coaching as a viable option through peers is, is something that we're really interested in offering, uh, even if it's not something that is uh, billable in the traditional Medicaid um, fee-for-service landscape. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohini. I think that's actually a really good transition into our next question because we're starting to think about payment now, right? So we're, we've outlined some of the issues. We've outlined that there are social, social determinants of health. We've talked about the workforce and what kind of workforce is necessary uh, to really meet the needs of the community. And so now we're starting to talk about, well, how do you pay for something like that? Um, and so Dr. Royland, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit more about this. I know this is your area of expertise. Um, so we know that a major issue uh, so first, I, I want to sort of hear a little bit about the work you've been doing, um, but also specifically when it comes to children. I know that a major issue for value-based payments for, with children is that the outcomes often take many, many years into the future before you can really see them. Um, and so how can, as we're thinking about um, prevention, how can we sort of measure that value for, for, ch for children and youth mental health? No, thanks so much, Nita. It's a great question. And just to, as, as everyone else mentioned, just maybe step back for a moment and talk a little bit more about our, our work in general. Um, as I mentioned, we study value-based payment models, and I just want to sort of put that in context for the pediatric population specifically, but also the moment that we're in with COVID-19. And I'm sure a lot of you have been reading in the news just about how providers that are dependent on fee-for-service payment have really been struggling through this pandemic because folks stopped going into the, the clinic, stopped going in for elective procedures, and folks who are relying on fee-for-service payment, if you don't have those things happening, you don't have revenue coming in, and so uh, you, turn, you sort of end up in this sort of dire financial situation. And um, pediatric practices haven't been sort of spared that experience. And the service utilization for those folks, particularly pediatric primary care clinics, has been quite steep and has not rebounded to the level that we've seen in other specialties. And so um, that doesn't bear well for the future. Uh, especially for primary care clinics being the place, as Dr. Luthi mentioned, being the place where a lot of mental health and behavioral health is addressed, um, it, it, it doesn't bode well for the future and ensuring access and early prevention and intervention for, for children and their mental health needs. So um, what we've been studying uh, during this time is looking at how providers that are under value-based payment arrangements, so whether that be participation in the ACO where you may have access to some savings that you had um, accrued through your participation in the ACO, or if you've been participating in something like a global capitated model where you get a, a per member per month payment, how those types of providers have been able to fare better during the pandemic because they weren't so reliant on that fee-for-service payment and didn't experience the deep declines in revenue um, uh, that, that happened when folks stopped going into the office because they just weren't sure it was safe. Um, and so in terms of the pediatric population, I think uh, we really need to think about how we can, um, or pediatric providers, I should say, how they can be better sort of moved over into value-based payment models so that they are spared that kind of experience the next time a situation like this happens. And so we can ensure access uh, to, to children and youth to make sure that all of their needs, but especially their mental health needs, um, are continuing to be addressed. So just wanted to sort of start with that little sort of context setting piece. And our work in particular looked at how you could design an APM model uh, to sort of uh, build a, a care model that uh, did focus on prevention and bringing in those different types of providers and services that the other two speakers already mentioned. So I, I do just want to make a first point about prevention and sort of the value of alternative payment models and helping embed prevention into um, just the usual sort of clinical care that we deliver um, because those types of models do tend to give uh, providers uh, more flexibility and, and access to some more funding that can allow them to do things like setting up an outreach clinic for, for, uh, for children who are at risk for depression and anxiety. So um, folks could, in an ACO could use their savings to try to set up something like that. Or a pediatric primary care clinic operating under a global capitated budget uh, may have the ability to bring in behavioral health specialists that maybe they couldn't under a fee-for-service model just because they have a little bit more um, predictable revenue coming in and stable revenue and flexibility in how they're using that revenue. And so just wanted to make that first point about how um, value-based payment can help bring in more prevention into our into the care of children right now. 
Um, and in terms of measurement, it is a really tricky challenge. I mean, payers um, will like will want to know sort of shorter horizon. What are the outcomes that we're sort of affecting with the care that we're delivering? Um, but the outcomes that we're really um, we know are really powerful and, and really the ones we're trying to affect for the pediatric population are a little bit further down the line. So I think you have to try to develop a, a measurement strategy that tries to speak to those two audiences. So in the short term, what are some sort of internal process measures you could use to ensure that you're delivering the quality care that you want to be delivering? And looking at the outcomes that are of particular interest to payers, so things like ED admissions, hospital admissions, and how those might be related to behavioral health conditions. And then the longer term outcomes, unfortunately, there just aren't a whole lot of measures out there right now. So there's some development that needs to happen, particularly in, around um, the development of measures that capture, you know, not just uh, whether or not someone has depression or, dep or readmission, or remission, um, but things like just indications of child's flourishing. So kindergarten readiness, high school graduation, graduation rates, there needs to be more measurement in that space as well. So I think it's a short game and a long game and um, more work needs to be done in that area for sure. Yeah, that's great. And I think a really excellent point bringing kind of framing that at the beginning and talking about how things have changed now because of COVID-19 and how the way that practices um, are have learned a lot about what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. And I think that I'm, I'm also, I've seen this in my work at, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, we do see that there's sort of this, this shift towards value-based payment. And now that this, the whole system has been kind of like, you know, blown up, <laughs> I think there's sort of like an opportunity now to really move more, um, assertively towards value-based payment, which is, which is good. Um, so I kind of wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that point of, of measures, because that's really, when it comes to value-based payment, you have to sort of have specific outcome or process measures that are, that are telling both the provider what to do and also the payer what the value is of the services that, that they're paying for. So um, along those lines, I know that we talked about social determinants of health and kind of uh, cultural competency. So how could those um, type of things be wrapped up into into measures as well. Um, so I don't know if Dr. Mutha or Dr. Uh, Mokini, you wanted to, to speak a little bit about that. Um, well, I mentioned how one way that we were rolling the social determinants uh, uh, into a value-based program through uh, Z code claims. Um, uh, other ways that we're trying to uh, do that is we, we want to all be working under one system that's sort of uniform ideally you know um, and so part of that is also uh, working with stakeholders from different areas there, there is a coalition in DC for example called DC PAC we're really trying to you know kind of standardize the, the social determinant referral process really that would be happening whether it's on the provider side or the payer side and having it integrated with our health information exchange which is the sort of just the larger umbrella that would be capturing hospitals, clinics, and ideally bring in community-based organizations into that. So, I mean, that, that's another strategy where the more alignment you can get, as, as the payers, we're not, we're, we're driving, I think, the value-based care component, but we're also trying to provide that thought leadership in terms of, you know, here's how we manage this uh, population and how are ways that we can influence uh, providers to do the same to bring on the same platforms that we've been using for referrals for social service services so um, that's that's the area where I think we're trying to provide that guidance to the, the whole health system so that we're all working in the same way that's great um, so I think something else that I kind of wanted to circle back to was uh, the we took, Dr. Mutha and Dr. Mohini really really emphasized this. A lot of primary care is actually doing mental health care now, um, and a very large percentage of it. And um, that, that's, that was also part of my even for for sometimes in cases of serious mental illness, that that's the case, right? And they don't have necessarily the training or the resources to really do that. Um, and something like value-based payments could help kind of really get all the team members on the same page. But I was sort of wondering if, if, um, if Dr. Roiland or Dr. Mutha wanted to elaborate a little bit more on about how we can maybe better integrate mental health care into primary care, especially for, for, for children and youth. So maybe I'll, I'll respond first and then uh, hand it to Dr. Roiland. You know, I think there are some really promising models that have been in place for a little while that really talk about how do you take people that are perhaps not as skilled or need to be better skilled 
in identifying and treating mental health conditions. And so there are great examples of programs that are robust enough that have shown that you can take trained clinicians and specifically give them training in mental health disorders, so psychiatric diagnoses and conditions and treatments to really allow primary care clinicians and that, and I'm using that really quite broadly. So whether it's family medicine or internal medicine, nurse practitioners, to really be able to feel skilled and able to do the care that is necessary. I think that's one really pragmatic model. Uh, there are different duration programs and they've proven that they can actually increase access. So I think investing in programs like that, I think the same is gonna be true for um, other settings uh, for pediatrics and others as well. So. Those are examples. I think there is a lot to be said around some of the self-management stuff, which works for low acuity, less serious mental health illness. We see that the uptake is actually pretty good. And there's an interesting burgeoning in the, um, and some of it's in the for-profit arena, that's about access. And that works well for people who have those resources. But I think the concern we all share is as the economic crisis unfolds that is related to COVID, is how do we ensure that those same things are built in? And I think Dr. Mohini gave an example of, can you use text-based messaging that is through chat mechanisms and through uh, bots as well and show that that is useful, including virtual reality. So there's some great promise in the technology and the, the uh, uncoupling, if you will, of physical appointments with care. It offers an advantage, but there's it, it requires an investment. So I'm not... Uh, being naive about it either, that it, it's going to take some effort for us to, to get uh, the full potential there. Yeah, and I'll just follow up. I think that, that fantastic point about you first need to have a care model developed and shows, you know, effectiveness um, and have the evidence there for the care model to, before you can start thinking about building a payment model around it because it's a risk for, for providers and patients and for payers to go into these models. And they do require an initial period of investment, as Dr. Musa mentioned, and just time to develop the infrastructure and the workflows and the workforce training to get everyone into the flow of delivering care in that new way and to getting used to sort of operating under a new type of payment model. So I think it's um, to sort of have the, to, sort of, to see more of these models implemented out there, I think there needs to be a realization um, that there, it takes a period of investment, both time and money, to set up these types of models, um, but there needs to be a, a willingness to do that up front and a willingness to sort of give the, the program the, the timeline to sort of realize the, the sort of outcomes and savings that are so vital to making these types of models um, sustainable. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think as we think about these different care models, um, one thing that we've touched upon a little bit, I, I, I know that you were talking about sort of the texting, um, is, is telehealth. That's also something that's been very, um, that has totally changed in the, in the, in the time of COVID-19. And so I um, wanted to hear a little bit more about, uh, maybe we could start off from like the payer's perspective, like how you all are thinking about telehealth and especially opportunities for um, children and youth. Um, I know you mentioned texting, but there are also situations where like audio uh, might be the, the, the way to go, um, to kind of depending on, on the patient patient need. So I wanted to hear a little bit more. Um, Dr. Mohini, if you wanted to, to start us off sure. there. Yeah, I mean, I think if there's one area where Mental Health America can really continue their advocacy around this is, is ensuring that the some of the changes that have been made through the public health emergency can be continued in some way. I mean, we had this great opportunity having this Petri dish where we could really in real time see what the impacts of telehealth were. And I mean, I think what at least preliminarily what we've seen locally in DC is that people were able to maintain access in a meaningful way. Um, most Providers were satisfied with it. Most consumers were satisfied with it, um, particularly in the behavioral health space. That's one of the areas where we saw a, a, a uptick of telehealth claims. And, and it really makes sense in behavioral health where you're not as reliant on physical exam and laboratory. Um, so it's really doable. So, um, and, and a lot of that was audio only uh, in D.C. in particular because there was a, a acceptance of that in the local regs. So um, I, I do think that's an area where Mental Health America can really, uh, it, it's an access issue and it's a way of allowing for access and continuing the access um, moving forward. So hopefully we're not going back to the same 
kind of broken system that we were before. Yeah, I think that's right. Did, uh, did anyone else want to add um, on that point? You know, I'll add just one piece, which is I think that really paying attention to equity and access is going to be critical. That we've seen in our own practices that, yes, uh, more people have smartphones than perhaps we had realized, that age alone is not a barrier to access, but um, telephone access is really important. It's not just video or texting, and that a lot can be done through phone. It does allow people to not have to worry about taking time off from work when they may not be able to do that, to be able to come in for appointments. So I think that continuing payment and really thinking about the policy issues around payment and also certification of some of these health professionals that we've touched on, including peer providers, are going to be vital to really ensuring that we're getting the high quality outcomes that we want and also a living wage for people who are involved in the workforce. Yeah, I think we've honestly only begun to scratch the surface uh, on these issues. We could continue talking about this for another three hours, um, but unfortunately we're, we're at time. So um, I think we've heard some really wonderful things here from, from the panelists and the experts here. So one is that we need to invest. If, we're, if we really need to put our money where our mouth is, if we're saying that we want you know, early detection, we want prevention, um, we want to be able to catch mental health conditions early, we have to really put you know, invest the funds in that. Um, to really do that and also incorporate accountability. So have um, process and outcome measures in place that are really reflective of the population. They might not be the sort of short-term measures that you have for other, but for adults necessarily, but maybe looking at things like school readiness, as Dr. Royland pointed out, um, being a little more flexible with that. Um, and I think when it comes to workforce development, having a, a culturally competent workforce, but also looking to, to other members, not just the clinicians, but, but sort of um, certified individuals who might be coming, might be more reflective of the patient population relations who they are serving. So um, lots of lots of sort of food for thought here. Um, really thankful for this um, for this discussion that we had today and um, looking forward to continuing the discussion in the future. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, we are happy to welcome some of our speakers back now for a live Q&A session. Um, grateful to have uh, Dr. Yavar Mohimi of Emeritus, uh, of Emeritus, Amy Malloy of Mental Health America in New York State. She's the project director there. Um, Ariana Gross of Covington, Georgia, who's our awesome youth advocate um, that when we saw testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee at the House of Representatives, at the US House of Representatives, we knew we had to get her voice in the conversation here today. Um, and we have the immediate past president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris. Uh, we also have uh, Sam Brinton, the uh, vice president of advocacy and government affairs at the Trevor Project. Um, and thank you all so much for joining. We're uh, just so grateful to have you for a couple of minutes uh, today to answer some questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Dr. Harris, since we got a question right after your session earlier today. How do we emphasize using evidence-based strategies, yet there aren't evidence-based strategies that are culturally relevant? Absolutely. <laughs> Good to be uh, with you for this uh, live session. Just want to make sure you can hear me okay, because I do plan to write a book after we get through this and it will be, uh, you're, you're on mute, right? So, <laughs> so nobody's still that. You know, that, that is a conundrum because we absolutely do always want uh, to promote the use of evidence-based strategies, um, but we don't always have the evidence that we need on particular populations. So let me just start with the broader. If there is data out there that shows the particular intervention works, uh, but perhaps it did not have the diversity and the trial participation. It's still valid, I believe. And so I don't think we should say, oh, because we didn't have a totally diverse uh, group that was a part of the uh, investigation, we should not use it. 
So that being said, we should be on a mission and be critically focused to make sure that going forward, we get the data on a diverse uh, population. That has to be in the going forward, again, because we've not had it in the past, but going forward, we have to make that commitment to center equity to make sure we have evidence on a diverse group of participants. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Harris. Uh, I think I wanted to kind of, kind of move over and talk a little bit about how the health system can be integrated with education and how kind of community agencies can all come together to meet the needs of students in schools. Um, you've talked a lot about integration. Um, Ariana and Amy, you guys are in the schools and working with other leaders in the schools. Um, would you like to share about how your um, mental health and education program, Amy, or Ariana, how some of your peer programs have kind of evolved over time in case someone is interested in how their organization might do some similar advocacy in their own school districts? Ariana, you wanna go first? Oh, sure. Um, thank you. For my program, um, the way that we've evolved, I think I'm with Dear Tara Success, which is my, um, my original organization that has allowed me to reach out to all these other ones. Um, we originally started out just a few people and we were just talking to youth and getting a message out there. And I think working with Stay Promise Clubs and Sandy Hook allowed us to get a bit more structure because they're like, programs that put in place how we can best meet the needs of our students. And so giving this opportunity to us is so important. Um, me allowing, me just knowing that I have those resources to that give me direct if can help people is um, the best. Another thing is that, is that you're, I'm sorry. No, I think um, there's some extra noise in the background. So I, I definitely understand if, if it's a little hard to get through that. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just my brother, but uh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, um, okay. We're working from home. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're in the pandemic. Yes. No reason to be embarrassed. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. But um, yeah, so I think the best way is to come up with a direct plan of how you're going to achieve your goals. So if your goal is to like for our goal is to get into schools and teach students how to help their peers better. So we went from just like, you know, talking to them about like um, different topics every time to its direct plan using um, saves trusted adult and um, know the science program. So the just having a like, plan of how you want to go through with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Ariana. Amy, would you talk a little bit yeah. about how your, your program has evolved? Sure. And I think, you know, we have focused on um, mental health education in schools, but it's uh, we very quickly learned that it's not just about raising awareness and teaching students about mental health. It's this um, whole sort of system that wraps around that. And so going back to that idea of integration, I think there's some really, really wonderful models, community schools models. Um, for how we can bring some of those services to where people are. But at the end of the day, not everyone has access to those kinds of resources. And so it really is about partnering with community providers um, and other community organizations and stakeholders like libraries or boys and girls clubs or peer support organizations, um, peer advocacy to help families and students and staff in schools um, deliver all the services that are needed. And, and I think in that way, we can also address a lot of barriers that create um, you know, access issues for families and for students. And so this and mental health education is really just a part of a bigger puzzle um, and all of it works together. And, and also to that end, I think that um, community providers can be a great partner in helping educate students and families about the resources that are available, the treatment options that are available and can do it in a way that 
is um, really responsive to the needs of the individual communities. So those kinds of relationships are really, really important in, in, in that integration. Um, schools are being asked to do more with less always. And so wherever we can partner and help each other out, that's really, that's going to be really important. Um, I know there are some uh, specific kind of evidence-based um, health services that are being provided to students um, through CDC's injury prevention program. Sam, can you talk about maybe what, uh, what benefits that some students are are finding in getting health health services at school or through telehealth now that we're in the pandemic, but through their school. Yeah, it's schools have been um, a, a saving grace, I would call it in a way for LGBTQ youth. And so as we have moved and transitioned to education, maybe at home, we're noticing that although there may not be a lot more uh, calls to maybe like the National Lifeline, the Trevor Project is getting nearly twice as many contacts of crisis um, during COVID as before because schools weren't quite ready to provide um, what I would call, uh, you know, extremely um, private and, and safe spaces um, in remote locations, right? Like they, their whole point was that you were able to get this mental health care. And like, as you mentioned, Karen, right? Like they were able to get access to really great services when they were in the school building. But how does it work when you can't really tell the person across on this Zoom screen, you know, that you're LGBT and that you may need a little bit different services because your parents may be sitting right across the table from you. And so I think how schools will, um, meet this challenge is going to be based on how they recognize the differences in high-risk populations. It doesn't mean that anyone is necessarily um, doomed, and it doesn't mean that anyone deserves to be celebrated. It just recognizes different needs for different people. And for LGBTQ youth specifically, I think one of the great things that I love about Amy's work is that it says to a school, you need to, you are already doing good things let's help you do even better things, right? Let's give you the resources to do the great things. Um, and as Ariana was mentioning, right? Like we, it's, it's about making sure that we're listening. I think when you, Karen, you, you did mention a little bit like CDC has some of these resources and we've been working closely with them to make sure that people know that, you know, LGBTQ youth are in super crisis. We've heard the CDC stat of one in four young adults seriously considering suicide in June. That's why the Trevor Project is getting so many calls is because we're hearing from people that they're not getting the services that they necessarily need at, um, as they're returning to school. So I think it's going to be really critical that we support community-based services, right? So what can we do to build a picture around an, a young person at high risk that says, you may not be in the schoolroom anymore, but you still have the same resources. And we're going to figure out ways to match those resources to your specific needs, not just assume that every single person is super glad that they get to sit across the, you know, um, table from their parents when they're trying to have these types of conversations. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I want to just turn to Dr. Mohini uh, before we have to wrap up. We have um, a little bit about your background in working with the Medicaid population, which I think you said it's about 50% youth, about 50% adults. Can you share with us a little bit about um, why prevention is important in your space and, and what you're doing to um, kind of move things upstream so that <laughs> your system, your whole system can um, ensure that there's some accountability for meeting the needs of young people? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think historically when you think about, you know, Medicaid or just insurance in general, it's more reactive and responsive to claims and the information that they're getting based on utilization, right? So if a child shows up in the hospital, then there, there's an awareness of the psychiatric crisis that was happening. But how do we sort of know, how do we get ahead of that and sort of know who are our at-risk kids and what can we be doing to avoid that hospitalization to begin with? Because it's good for the system, and it's good for them to not be on that acute level of care if we can get them into more outpatient uh, level care sooner, right? So we have different ways of trying to um, 
triage and 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 tier our 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 network of of members and trying to figure out more proactive ways of outreach you know whether it's through text space now we have the capabilities now of a lot of virtual visits that we didn't necessarily have before so if somebody calls in crisis or they're calling our care management you know there's no reason why we can't get a visit with a provider within 24 hours you know whereas before some of those access issues caused um, you know some barriers for folks getting into the care they needed so I think we're at, we're at a unique place now where prevention is much more capable in, in the Medicaid space because we're we're monitoring how everyone's doing as a response to COVID too because we're, we're really wanting to make sure our at-risk populations whether on the physical health side or the behavioral health side are having their needs met and making sure they're aware that virtual care is an option for them now too. Thank you. And then I think one final question for anyone to answer we, that came in is about social emotional learning for infants and toddlers. So is anyone aware of how prevalent um, uh, social emotional learning is for, for children as young as, you know, one years old or two years old? Well, I would just say not enough, clearly. Uh, that I think we know there, of course, are programs here and there, but that is an area that's ripe uh, for improvement, um, in a ripe for a lot of work incorporating that, of course, into work that we're already thinking about regarding trauma-informed care, regarding pre-K, working with families, um, integrating that into, I guess it would be primary care, but the work between pediatricians and and other uh, clinicians that are more specialized in mental health. So I, I just think certainly not enough an area that we really need to pay particular attention to and to make sure, as Sam said, there are adequate resources to do the work. Sure. Thank you so much for that response. Um, you know, I have to admit that it was only last year that I learned there is kind of um, mental health and substance use testing of infants and during the neonatal period. Um, and so there's if you if there's a way to figure out that something is wrong, <laughs> then there should be also a way to help um, treat and prevent um, something from going wrong or for for making improvements. Um, and Karen, if I could just add, because we don't want people to think that we are diagnosing uh, disorders in infants, right? It, it's really <laughs> about uh, working with families and making sure that they are really developing appropriately more so than, you know, diagnosing problems. And I love that, too, because it talks about prevention and it talks about the important work we need to do. Um, on the early intervention and prevention side and not really even about diagnosing. They're all important, uh, but I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining. It is a, a great pleasure of ours to have you here live, um, even just for a brief moment. Um, thank you for the work and please continue forward. Um, I will turn it now to Dr. Don Mordecai, who uh, the audience may recall is the national leader for mental health and wellness at Kaiser Permanente, our sponsor. Uh, we're so grateful for um, the funding that Kaiser put together and, and, and gave us for this program, Policy Institute, moving upstream. Um, Don will provide closing remarks at this time. Um, and we want to thank he and his colleagues in particular, um, Kevin and Shannon and Samantha and Cecilia, uh, everyone who who made sure that um, this that he was able to join today. And uh, thank you for your work advancing uh, uh, early intervention and prevention of mental health. Well, uh, thank you, Karen. Um, we're we're so pleased to be able to support this program. I mean, it's the the range of voices that we've heard from today. The range of topics has been absolutely incredible. Um, it, it felt like every single person made important contributions. So for me to try and sum it all up in some magic statement is is impossible. So um, you know, let me let me say a couple things. Um, one is it's absolutely clear that there are opportunities before us 
even despite the incredible challenges um, that we're all facing from the pandemic, from the economic collapse. Um, and I would say even some of the challenges, for instance, around racial justice also present incredible opportunities for us, as we heard around um, health equity and, and issues like that. Um, I did want to call out, you know, we started out with, with Congressperson Katko and um, the, the, the thing that struck me most from, from what he said was, you know, there are very powerful people, you know, Congress people of the United States who care about these issues. And we should never forget about that and never forget that they need our support, right? They need to hear from us that we care about these issues too, that we vote on these issues and things like that. So, so they need to know that we, we have their backs. Um, we got to hear from several people who have successfully advocated themselves uh, for policy changes that make a difference for youth and, and adults uh, with mental health and substance use issues. And so I would say to all of us, you know, we can be those people too. Uh, as, as Dr. McCoy said, you know, be that champion. Um, we, we are the ones who care about these issues and, and we need to use our voices um, to make things happen. Um, Great to hear from Dr. Harris, uh, who is a fellow child psychiatrist, the, the first uh, black woman uh, head of the AMA, um, just a terrific voice um, on these issues. And um, you know, she reminded us about the importance of adverse childhood experiences and recognizing that many, many of the children in our society experience adverse childhood experiences and that those experiences have an impact long th throughout the lifespan um, and it's a mental health impact it's a physical health impact it's a social health impact and so if we can address things upstream address adverse childhood experiences um, that could be very powerful um, some of you may know that kaiser permanente was uh, we, we did the original research on adverse childhood experiences along with the cdc and recently we've announced a 2.75 million dollar grant to further that research and so you know, we see uh, important learnings to, to be had uh, looking at adverse childhood experiences and addressing them. Uh, we heard a lot about the importance of supporting mental health in schools, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the schools are the places where kids are, where we want them to be, and yet we know that in, in many instances they don't have the kind of support that they need. Um, so this is a really important policy area is, is to bring them that support. I, I think we, we talk a lot in the healthcare profession about medical homes and schools strike me as social homes, right? A places where kids and parents and staff and teachers all come together. Um, and we do uh, a fair amount of work in that space uh, with a program called Thriving Schools um, uh, that I could say more about, but uh, <laughs> given the time constraints, I won't. Um, uh, but needless to say, schools are an important place. So let me let me pause there um, and say thank you to all of our speakers and moderators who, as I said, I think were just incredible. Um, Mental Health America, Karen, you were thanking us, but thank you uh, to you uh, and the Kaiser Permanente staff for putting together just a terrific program. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, Sydney. Um, and most of all, thanks to everybody who's uh, joined us um, we appreciate your interest in and your commitment to this work. And um, I really wanted to close out um, uh, with, with reminding people about Ariana, who you just saw again in, in the question and answer, but um, you know, the, the importance of doing this work, not just for the young people, but with the young people. And uh, Ariana said, we're not going to stop. Uh, so I'd say let's all, Keep going forward together. Thank you.